All right, you may be seated. Good morning, jurors. Thank you so much for your patience. All right, next witness. Jeremy Cole, PJ Pesch. Do you swear firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, have a seat talking to the microphone. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Can you please tell the jury your full name? Uh, it's Paul Peter Pesch, Jr., but uh, I've always been referred to as P.J. Pesch. Mr. Pesch, what do you do for a living? Uh, I direct and write movies and television. How long have you been in the business of directing and writing movies and television? Uh, 35 years. Can you give the jury a background on your uh, movies that you've directed in a, kind of a biographical sketch? Sure. Uh, I attended Columbia University uh, and studied under Martin Scorsese and did a short film that traveled around the world. I wound up getting a deal at Paramount in 1990. Um, I directed a film for Roger Corman in 1991 that I wrote and directed. In 1995, I directed a Western with Sam Elliott that we actually shot at Bonanza Creek Ranch. Um, that was a also rather lower budgeted short schedule. Uh, I've directed six feature films and close to 100 hours of television. Um, I've created television shows, um, written and sold movie scripts. Um, I've worked for Paramount, uh, Warner Brothers, HBO, Universal, Fox. Anything else? I uh, that's um, a really good background, and I, I just want to ask you with regard uh, to the Western on Bonanza Creek. That's also the site of, of where Rust was found. Is that right? That's what I understand. Yeah. Well, Mr. Pesh, um, it sounds like you have experience also with uh, movies involving firearms. Yes. Um, many of the television shows and I think four or five of the six films, two of them were westerns. Uh, one of them was one of the Sniper series with Tom Berenger. Uh, one of them was uh, Smoke and Aces, which had a considerable amount of gunfire. In your uh, work on the movies involving uh, gunfire, have you had the occasion to work with armors and prop masters? I have. And actually, in all of the movies you've done, I'm sure I'm certain you've worked with prop masters. Yes. Okay, sir. And with regard to those movies that you've directed in television, have you worked with uh, directors, first assistant directors, and understood people's roles on the set? I have. Okay. With regard to armors, have you ever worked on a prior film in which an armorer had split duties as an armorer and a props? I have not. With regard to uh, this situation where there is a uh, gun heavy set I will represent to you, would you think, in your experience and what you've seen, it would be advisable to have a part-time armorer doing two jobs? I would say that would be highly inadvisable. Whose responsibility is it to properly staff with regard to the movie functions? Uh, the line producer or the, the unit production manager. When you have a set involving upwards of 20 firearms, would it be, in your experience, possible for a part-time armorer to manage that? I wouldn't imagine so. Um, 
one person can each one of those weapons needs to be tracked pretty consistently for the set to remain safe so I don't see how a single person can keep their eye on 20 firearms. With regard to overall set safety and your experience and background, who is in charge of that? The first AD is considered in all of the published safety advisories uh, the chief safety officer on the set. Are you a member of various guilds? I'm a member of the Writers Guild, the Directors Guild, SAG-AFTRA, which is the Actors Guild, and I also happen to be a member of the Musicians Guild. Okay, so when you talk about safety rules, uh, are some of those from those guilds? Yes, there's a, I can't remember the name of the organization, but they sort of uh, collectively represent all of the various guilds and issue recommendations for safety uh, that they recommend uh, attaching to the call sheet each day. Is it, in your experience, also um, something you've seen where there will be daily safety meetings on set, especially in a gun-heavy set? Okay. Expert. Expert. Uh, yes, Your Honor. We, I believe he can give lay opinions on his experience, but, but also we would tender him as an expert. I, I think we should approach... So Mr. Pesch, you were discussing some of those safety rules now. Would it be, in your experience, advisable for uh, production to convene daily safety meetings? Yes, in fact, it's recommended by all of the published literature uh, by the guilds. Um, and it's been my, they, they recommend that a safety meeting takes place anytime uh, there's to be any stunts, firearms, special effects, but it's been my experience that in the last seven or eight years since the tragic incident with the camera assistant who was killed on the railroad bridge that every first AD I've worked with, regardless of what's happening that day on the call sheet, has a quick safety meeting just running over and reiterating basic safe practices. And, and you as a uh, director, uh, is that something that you advise and you practice? I don't give safety meetings. That's the job of the safety officer, the first AD, but I think it's a great idea. In your experience in, in interacting with first assistant directors, if, for example, there's a situation where a set is rushing, there's safety issues occurring, does the first assistant director have any responsibility in that respect? Most definitely. And what would that be in your experience? What would, what would you expect to see happen? Um, my experience has been that the first has an announcement to everybody, slow down, this is not safe, or we're not doing this, or just takes charge. And uh, if there's a specific issue with a crew member, they'll pull them aside and discuss the issue and consult with stunts or props or uh, firearms and deal with it. Is that also true, for example, if you have a issue with an actor, uh, for example, uh, firing a blank after somebody yells cut, 
What would the first AD be expected to do in your experience? Uh, speak with them and indicate. Look, when cut is called, uh, usually the only person that can call cut is the director. But if, if it's a safety issue, anybody can call cut. And once cut is called, everything needs to stop. Because if there is a safety issue, obviously, that somebody's noticed, nothing else should take place. So, yes, the first AD should speak to that performer. When it comes to safety, what is your view as to everybody's responsibility on set? Well, again, it's not just my view, but again, in the published literature of the, of the various guilds, they indicate safety is everyone's responsibility. If there's a safety issue, there are anonymous hotlines for anybody to call and raise these issues. And are those uh, anonymous hotlines, are those published generally in your experience working on set? They are. Usually they're uh, with that safety recommendations that are attached to the call sheet. And those hotlines, uh, what, are they, what do they provide for people to be able to do if they notice a safety failure? Uh, you can call the, someone from your guild. Uh, each of the studios has their own separate hotline. Um, uh, and as far as I know, that will allow you to anonymously, so you don't... Look, if you report something, you could put your career in jeopardy. Nobody wants to do that, but um, the idea is that a representative can provide that information to somebody who will take action, such as the producer the UPM or the first AD. In your experience, uh, have you worked and seen the interaction between prop masters and armors? I have. And can you tell the jury, in your experience generally, how they interact, uh, who's in charge of the firearms and who's in charge of the ammunition and then what the prop master role is? Well, the prop master, more often than not, hires the armorer because that's a subset of that department. But the armor is in charge of all ammunition, all firearms, um, maintaining them, uh, keeping them safe, and inventorying the ammunition. With those duties and responsibilities, would you believe it be to be important in your experience to accord the armor adequate time to do those duties? Yes. And would it be important to accord adequate resources uh, for that armor to do those duties? Yes. If there is a scenario where the um, armor is dealing with um, a gun-heavy set, not having those resources, who would you expect to assist that, that armor in getting those? Props. If there is a situation where um, there is a scene, a video, something's happening, and both the armor and first assistant director witness a uh, safety violation involving a, a weapon, for example, um, what would be your assessment whether one or both of them um, should say something about that? I would say both of them should say something about it and figure out why it happened and uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Cross exam. Mr. Pesh, I just have a couple follow up questions for you. Thank you for your time today. Certainly. Um, 
So anyone on the crew can stop filming due to safety concerns, is that right? That's right. And that includes Ms. Gutierrez? That's correct. Um, and, sir, did you read or watch the statements of Ms. Gutierrez in preparation for your testimony? I did not. That was my understanding. Um, so, are you aware that on October 21st, 2021, um, Ms. Gutierrez was not inside the church with the gun, not because she was working on props, but because she was just doing some other armor duties? Objection, Your Honor. Do I need to restate the question? Do you yes. remember? Yes, okay. please. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, we, we saw some, some uh, interviews from Ms. Gutierrez, and, and she does uh, explain that she was not in the church because she was um, preparing her fanny pack and her blank ammunition for the next scene. You agree that that sounds like armor work to, to, to you, not props work? Yes. Okay. Um, and are you also aware, sir, that on the morning of the 21st, when the crew was waiting for replacement camera personnel to arrive, Ms. Gutierrez had approximately three hours uh, to work on her preparation for the scenes that day? I was not aware of that. Okay, thank you. I'll pass the witness. Any redirect? Uh, just uh, very briefly, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Petschiff. There was um, a scene going on inside the church at that time involving Mr. Baldwin and the firearm. If Ms. Gutierrez Reed was not in the church, would you have expected someone to have called her back in? I would. If there's a firearm on set, there should be an armor on set. No, nothing further, Your Honor. All right, thank you. You're excused. Thank, thank you. you. Council approach. Next witness. At this time, the defense rests. Okay, thank you. All right, so both sides have rested. It's now my duty to give you the instructions of law. I'm going to read them to you, and then you will get a copy of the instructions, okay? The instructions I'm giving you are very helpful for the um, counsel to uh, use in their closing arguments, okay, which will follow. All right, so instruction number one. You have heard all the evidence. It is now my duty to tell you the law that you must follow in this case. Instruction number two. 
The law governing this case is contained in instructions that I am about to give you. It is your duty to follow the law as contained in these instructions. You must consider these instructions as a whole. You must not pick out one instruction or parts of an instruction and disregard others. A copy of these instructions will be given to you when you begin your deliberations. Instruction number three. The law presumes the defendant to be innocent unless and until you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of her guilt, his or her guilt. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It is not required that the state prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. The test is one of reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense, the kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act in the graver and more important affairs of life. Instruction number four. You are the sole judges of the facts in this case. It is your duty to determine the facts from the evidence produced here in court. Your verdict should not be based on speculation, guess, or conjecture. Neither sympathy nor prejudice should influence your verdict. You are to apply the law as stated in these instructions to the facts as you find them, and in this way decide the case. Instruction number five. Your verdict must represent the considered judgment of each juror. In order to return a verdict, it is necessary that each juror agrees. Your verdict must be unanimous. It is your duty to consult with one another and try to reach an agreement. However, you are not required to give up your individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but you must do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your own view and change your opinion if you are convinced it is erroneous. But do not surrender your honest conviction as to the weight or effect of evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or for the purpose of reaching a uh, verdict. You are the judges, judges of the facts. Your sole interest is to ascertain the truth from the evidence in this case. Instruction number six, each crime charged in the information should be considered separately. Instruction number seven, you must not concern yourself with the consequences of your verdict. Instruction number eight, you must not draw any inference of guilt from the fact that the defendant did not testify in this case, nor should this fact be discussed by you or enter into your deliberations in any way. Instruction number nine, you alone are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses and the weight to be given to the testimony of each of them. In determining the credit to be given any witness, you should take into account the witness's truthfulness or untruthfulness, ability and opportunity to observe, memory, manner while testifying, any interest, bias, or prejudice the witness may have, and the reasonableness of the witness's testimony considered in light of all of the evidence in the case. Instruction number 10. You should consider each opinion received in evidence in this case and give it such weight you think it deserves. If you should conclude that the reason given in support of the opinion, the reasons given in support of the opinion are not sound, or that for any other reason an opinion is not correct, you may disregard the opinion entirely. Instruction number 11. An expert witness is a witness who, by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education, has become expert in any subject. An expert witness may be permitted to state an opinion as to that subject. You should consider each expert opinion and the reasons stated for the opinion, giving them such weight as you think they deserve. You may reject an opinion entirely if you conclude that it is unsound. Instruction number 12. For you to find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter as charged in count one, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, Hannah Gutierrez endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. Two, Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by Hannah Gutierrez's actions. action. Three, Hannah Gutierrez acted with a willful disregard for the safety of others. Four, Hannah Gutierrez's act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. 
Five, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October 2021. Instruction 12A. For you to find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter in count one alternative, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, Hannah Gutierrez loaded live ammunition into a firearm intended to contain only inert ammunition and or Hannah Gutierrez failed to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition she loaded into the firearm. Two, Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by Hannah Gutierrez's action. Three, Hannah Gutierrez acted with a willful disregard for the safety of others. Four, Hannah Gutierrez's act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. Five, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October, 2021. Instruction number 13, for you to, define, for you to find the defendant guilty of neg negligent use of a deadly weapon as a lesser included offense charged in count one, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, the defendant endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. Two, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October. 2021. Instruction number 13a. For you to find the defendant acted negligently in this case, you must find that the defendant acted with willful disregard of the rights or safety of others and in a manner which endangered any person or property. Instruction 13b. In addition to the other elements of tampering with evidence, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant acted intentionally when she committed the crime. A person acts intentionally when she purposely does an act which the law declares to be a crime. Whether the defendant acted intentionally may be inferred from all of the surrounding circumstances, such as the manner in which she acts, the means used, or her conduct. Instruction number 14. You have been instructed on the crimes of involuntary manslaughter and the lesser included offense of negligent use of a firearm as charged in count one. It is up to you, the jury, to choose the manner and order in which you deliberate on the crimes charged in that count. However, to return a verdict, you must follow the procedure described in the next instruction. Instruction number 15. To aid you in your deliberations and in returning your verdict, you will be provided both guilty and not guilty forms for each of the charges for each of the crimes charged in count one. Unless you unanimously agree on a verdict, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime. Although you may deliberate on the crimes charged in count one in any manner and order which you choose, you must return your verdicts for each offense in count one in the order they are instructed. Under this procedure, if you unanimously find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you should sign the guilty form for that offense and should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining offense in count one. If after reasonable deliberation, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on involuntary manslaughter, you should not sign a verdict form for that offense and should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining offense. You should only return a verdict on negligent use of a firearm if you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you must sign the not guilty verdict form for involuntary manslaughter before returning a verdict on any other crime charged in count one. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of negligent use of a firearm, you should sign the guilty verdict for that offense. If you do not reach a unanimous verdict on negligent use of a firearm, you should not sign a verdict form for that offense. Instruction number 16. In this case, as to the charge of involuntary manslaughter contained in count one, there are four possible verdicts. One, guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Two, not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Three, guilty of negligent use of a firearm. Four, not guilty of negligent use of a firearm. You must consider each of these crimes. You should be sure that you fully understand the elements of each crime before you deliberate further. 
You have the discretion to choose the manner and order in which you deliberate on this count, but you must return a unanimous verdict of not guilty on involuntary manslaughter before entering a verdict on negligent use of a firearm. You will first decide whether the defendant is guilty of the crime of involuntary manslaughter. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then that is the only form of verdict which is to be signed as to this count. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then you should sign only the not guilty form as to involuntary manslaughter. If, after reasonable deliberation, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on involuntary manslaughter, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime, and you should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining crime. If you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you will then go on to a consideration of the crime of negligent use of a firearm. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of negligent use of a firearm, then that is the only form of verdict which should be signed. But if you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of the crime of negligent use of a firearm, then you should sign only the not guilty form. If, after reasonable deliberation, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on negligent use of a firearm, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime. You may not find the defendant guilty of more than one of the foregoing crimes. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the defendant has committed any one of the crimes, you must determine that the defendant is not guilty of that crime. If you find the defendant not guilty of all of these crimes in count one, you must return a verdict of not guilty as for this count. Instruction number 17. For you to find the defendant guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in count two, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. One, the defendant Hannah Gutierrez had a baggie of cocaine by asking Rebecca Smith to take it outside of Hannah Gutierrez's hotel or hid a baggie of cocaine by asking Rebecca Smith to take it outside of Hannah Gutierrez's hotel room. Two, by doing so, the defendant intended to prevent the apprehension, prosecution, or conviction of Hannah Gutierrez for the crime of involuntary manslaughter. Three, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 21st day of October, 2021. Instruction number 18. A firearm means any weapon which will or is designed to or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the actions of an explosion. The frame or receiver of a firearm, any firearm muffler or firearm silencer. Firearm includes any handgun, rifle, or shotgun. Instruction number 19. In addition to the other elements of the crime of involuntary manslaughter as set, in for, as set forth in instruction number 12a, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt, doubt that 1. The death was a foreseeable result of Hannah Gutierrez placing a live round into a firearm intended to contain only inert ammunition and or Hannah Gutierrez's failure to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition she loaded into the firearm. 2. The act of the defendant was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. The defendant's act was a significant cause of death if it was an act which, in a natural and continuous chain of events, uninterrupted by an outside events, resulted in the death and without which the death would have not occurred. There may be more than one significant cause of death. If the acts of two or more persons significantly contribute to the cause of death, each act is a significant cause of death. Instruction number 20. The state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's act was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. An issue in this case is whether the negligence of a person other than the defendant may have contributed to the cause of death. Such contributing negligence does not relieve the defendant of responsibility for an act that significantly contributed to the cause of death so long as the death was a foreseeable result of the defendant's actions. However, if you find the negligence of a person other than the defendant was the only significant cause of death or constitutes an intervening cause that breaks the foreseeable chain of events, then the defendant is not guilty of the offense of involuntary manslaughter. Instruction number 21, 
Now the lawyers will argue the case. What is said in, in the closing arguments is not evidence. It is an opportunity for the lawyers to discuss the evidence and the law as I have instructed you. The state has the right to argue first, the defense may then argue, and the state may then reply. Counsel? Thank you, Your Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May it please the court, counsel. Um, I want to begin by thanking you all for your time. I know that this has been a, a long trial, and um, I also understand that as jurors, you find yourselves maybe a little frustrated. There's a lot of sitting around and waiting. Um, and uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate the sacrifice that you make when you leave your jobs and your families and your other responsibilities and you come to court uh, to participate in a very, very important part of our justice system. So on behalf of the state of New Mexico, uh, we thank you very much for your time. And as you can see on your screens, we end exactly where we began, in the pursuit of justice for Helena Hutchins. I want to start by just generally outlining Hannah Gutierrez failed to maintain firearm safety, making a fatal accident willful and foreseeable. And please keep in mind that omissions can also be willful. So if we fail to do something that we should do, and that failure uh, results in someone's death, then that too uh, can be willful. So I would ask that you keep that in mind as we move through uh, some of the evidence and testimony that you have heard. I know that you have heard a lot, and I do not intend to keep you too long, uh, but I do have to be thorough. I do want to hit uh, some high points. So I do appreciate your patience. Um, here's what we saw. These videos, if you recall, that were taken by production outfitters, they were taken on October 13th of 2021. What these demonstrate to you is that Ms. Gutierrez was unwilling to maintain proper firearm safety repeatedly. And it's really important because this is not a case where Hannah Gutierrez made one mistake and that one mistake was accidentally putting a live round into that gun. That's not what this case is about. This case is about constant, never-ending safety failures that resulted in the death of a human being and nearly killed another. So let's talk about all of the safety failures that we saw and the reason that these safety failures prior to October 21st are so critically important to the analysis is because they go to foreseeability. And foreseeability is a very important element in this case. So as we can see here, we have our um, stunt man with his double barrel shotgun. From watching those videos, what you understood is that Ms. Gutierrez did appear to, in fact, be present because at times we saw her and at times we heard her. So she wasn't off doing prop duties. 
She was right there, and she never intervened. Gun pointed at a child. Gun pointed at Joel Souza directly at his back. Gun pointed up in the air in the direction of the stunt coordinator. Gun pointed again apparently in the direction of Mr. Souza, the person on the far right. Gun pointed directly at Mr. Souza again, the firearm in the left hand of the stuntman who is facing you. Firearm pointed directly at a minor child. Firearm pointed directly at the camera. Ms. Gutierrez holding that same firearm with the muzzle pointed at her own face. Um, this was unexpected. Ms. Gutierrez stood by and did nothing in between scenes when that stuntman, who had certainly been sent the message that he could do whatever he wanted with those guns, no one was going to intervene. The person tasked with intervening was not going to do it. That was clear. He hands the firearm to the child and allows the child to manipulate the gun before then, after a short period of time, perhaps thinking better of it and taking the gun back. This firearm, I actually don't think in this photo that the firearm is pointed at the child. I think the firearm is, based on the angle of the camera, probably more pointed at this person right here. Um, but She's there. We hear her. We see her. She does nothing. Absolutely nothing. This is some of the first evidence that we see where if something doesn't stop, if something doesn't change, she is moving in, in the direction of potentially a fatal incident, and that is exactly what happened. And I want you to recall Ms. Gutierrez's interview on November 9th when Ms. Gutierrez uh, spoke of the accidental discharge with the other stuntman. Um, having a complete lack of understanding of her role in safety on this movie set, She's talking about Sarah Zachary, and she was like, well, yours just went off in there after you loaded it. And I said, yeah, well, I can't be responsible for every dickhead fucking stunt guy that gets a hold of the gun and doesn't understand the concept that it's hot. Her entire job is to be responsible for exactly that. And when she took this job, she agreed to that responsibility. There is no exception in the law for your young. The exception in the law does not exist. The law treats everyone the same, and it must. What was the point to the testimony about the lever action rifle? Well, here's the point to the testimony about the lever action rifle. More negligence, more carelessness, more lack of attention to safety. She loaded a lever action rifle with dummy rounds that, by the way, according to the director, was completely unnecessary. Because, yes, while it's true, this gun operates in a way where 
if a certain type of camera angle is hitting it, dummy rounds would be appropriate if the scene calls for loading or cycling. There wasn't a scene that called for that. So she just loaded a lever action rifle with dummy rounds and surprisingly put the wrong caliber round in the gun. That is absolutely an example of someone who is not paying attention, not taking their job seriously. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the rounds that you've seen because it's critical to tracking the existence of the live rounds on this movie set. And we have spent a lot of time and effort tracking those rounds around that movie set. We're going to show you that evidence right now. So the important thing to know is that the Seth Kenny dummies, which you are looking at right here, are patinaed. They are distinct. They have an antique coloring. They also have silver primers. These rounds did not come on that movie set until October 12th of 2021 because Mr. Kenny didn't have them. And if you recall his testimony, he was in Texas. So he had to get back, clean them up, and provide them to Sarah Zachary, and that took place on October 12th. This is just simply the primer side of those rounds. You can see that they're dark in color on the primer side, and they do appear to have silver primers. This is a photograph of the 3840 dummies. If you recall Mr. Kinney's testimony, the 3840 dummies came from Billy Ray. And the important thing about this photograph is that none of those dummy rounds had silver primers. And silver primer is a very important piece of this puzzle. This is those same rounds on their side. You can see that they are shiny brass. We also know that they have brass primers. We just saw that. Uh, based on Mr. Kenny's testimony, you know that they were 3840, but there was also some 4440 caliber rounds um, in that box. Does that matter if they're not working? Well, let's stop. Okay. Um, let's take a moment to talk about all this testimony that you've heard about whether or not the live rounds found at PDQ, which are photographed there on the left, match the live rounds found on the set of Rust. You don't have to be a gun expert to look at those and see they simply do not match. Even though you could look at those rounds and fundamentally understand that they are not the same, the police department, sorry, the sheriff's department sent them to the FBI for testing so that we could actually have some experts confirm what we can see with our very own eyes. And what you have in evidence, if you want to see them in, in real time, you have States Exhibit 79, you have States Exhibit 91. States Exhibit 79 is a disassembled live round from PDQ Props. States Exhibit 79 is a disassembled live round from the set of Rust. You can look at them, you can see the projectiles are different, you can see that uh, it, Perhaps the primers are even, are, are even different. If you recall, uh, Ms. Popple indicated there were only 10 silver primered live rounds found at PDQ. The rest of them were brass. The other thing that you can just see with your eyes is the gunpowder in these is substantially different. It has a different chemical composition. 
So any argument that could ever be made in this case that Seth Kinney was the source of these live rounds is absolutely dishonest. Now, I'm going to ask you to take a, take a walk in the weeds with me here, okay? This is a photograph of October 10th of 2021. You can see the color of the rounds at the top. Those are brass primered rounds. The rounds in the bottom appear to be lighter, and I would suggest to you, based on the totality of the evidence that we're gonna go through, that you are looking at live rounds. And keep in mind, anything that you see on the set of this movie that is a revolver ammunition, that is revolver ammunition prior to October 12th, if it has a silver primer, it's a live round because the silver primered dummies didn't come on set for two days after this photograph was taken. Here's our comparison photo that Mr. Primo put together for us. And if you need it, when you're reviewing the evidence and doing your deliberations or engaging in your deliberations, I have included it for you. Um, but we're going to do a comparison here in a moment. Now, the importance of this photograph, still October 10th of 2021, there, are, there appears to be revolver ammunition in the background there at the top. Two of those have silver primers. The problem with that is the silver primer dummies weren't there yet. But the live rounds were. And there's your close up. It's absolutely undeniable. Is it blurry? Yes. Can you clearly see the difference? Absolutely. All of these photos that you're looking at were October 10th. Now, Let's move to October 13th of 2021. I invite you to look at that photograph carefully and ask yourselves, which of these is not like the others? It's the third one from the left. Look at the shape of that projectile and look at the color of the brass. So on October 13th, Mr. Kenny's dummies have arrived on set. They are the only dummy rounds with silver primers, but they are patinaed in color. So when you look at this round, it appears to be a spot on match for the live rounds, but unfortunately we can't see the primer in this photo, so we can't tell if this is a brass primered dummy. That's the reason that we watched thousands of videos and looked at thousands of pictures because then we moved to the production outfitter videos from October 13th, the same day and we're looking at that same gun holster that was provided to Mr. Baldwin. And there you see it. The third one down has a silver primer. And now you know it is a live round. You know that because it's not a Seth Kinney dummy. If it were, it wouldn't have that shiny brass color. So there's your live round. We've seen it on October 10th. We've seen it on October 13th. And there's absolutely no way that the lighting is playing tricks on our eyes when we're looking at these enhanced photos because you see it frame 
after frame, after frame. And now let's move to October 15th. Karen Kuhn arrives on set. I think she was probably there long before the 15th. She is taking photos. She took approximately, as she testified, 9,000 photos. So on the 15th, there it is. There's your silver primer. It's just been moved to a different location in the holster because they're pulling dummy rounds from here, there, and everywhere and putting them in belts and putting them in guns and do, you know doing whatever they want to do. But there it is. It's right there on October 15th. And if you think I'm stretching it, Let's have a look at what we've got here. This is the gun belt that was assigned to actor Jensen Ackles. Because his gun belt was not a shoulder holster, we weren't able to find any photos or videos of it in the thousands and thousands and thousands that we reviewed because they're always covered by his coat. There is the evidence photo of the Baldwin holster on October 21st when it is taken into evidence. You have a Seth Kinney dummy at the top. You have what the FBI determined to be a live round in the second spot. And then you've got three brass primered dummies. October 17th, October 21st. So the video that Mamie Mitchell laid the foundation for. She said, she said that according to her notes, the filming was done on the 17th. Mr. Primo said that he believed according to the camera, it was the 18th. Take whatever date, whatever date you want. That's a match. Seth Kinney dummy at the top, live round next. You've got three brass primer dummies on the 21st, four brass primer dummies on the 17th or 18th. But it is shockingly the same. And there is no question that this one right here is a live round. It was sent to the FBI and they confirmed it. This is Ms. Gutierrez talking about um, her bringing these dummy rounds on set. I had a multitude of the ones with holes and the ones that you shake, so yeah. And I checked those all and I put them into two things. And then we start talking about boxes. Obviously when she says things, she's talking about boxes. They usually had JS on them. This is one my dad sent me, and mine are usually beat up pretty bad, like they're very dirty and gross. She's talking about the box and the styrofoam insert. The box and the styrofoam insert, she's saying, are dirty. Hers, the ones that she brings on set, are dirty. They're not new and clean like some of the other ones. Detective Hancock asks her, this is the one that was or handed that you guys had said that you had pulled from. This is that moment in that interview where Ms. Gutierrez has already shown Hancock the photo from her dad and an hour or two later, Detective Hancock decides that now is the time to show her the photo of the box of dummies she was pulling from that day, and it won't surprise you to learn they're a spot-on match. You have the styrofoam insert from that box of dummies here in evidence, and the reason that we gave it to you so that you can actually look at it 
in real time and not look at a photograph is because it's kind of dirty and gross. It kind of fits exactly the way that she described it. But there are some characteristics of this styrofoam insert that are going to become more important. Any, any suggestion by the defense that somehow the box of dummy rounds that Ms. Gutierrez said she was pulling from was swapped out with something different uh, is absolute nonsense. First of all, you know that because you can see the live rounds. If you don't think you can see them on the 10th, and you don't think you can see them on the 13th, and you don't think you can see them on the 15th, you know you're looking at one on the 17th and 18th. You know you are. So where's, where does the sabotage theory go then? The 17th and 18th, the camera crew hadn't quit yet. Mr. Norvell wasn't on set poking around on the, uh, on the prop cart. Mr. Halls hadn't had an opportunity to, to spend any time with the gun. They moved directly from that cart right into Lieutenant Benavides's patrol unit. They go from that patrol unit right into evidence at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department. And on November 9th of 2021, Hannah Gutierrez shows Detective Hancock, now Corporal Hancock, the box of dummies that she and her dad have. And if you listen to Mr. Kenny's testimony, what you understand is that the ammunition from the previous set, that being the old way, Hannah brought leftover dummies from that movie onto the set of Rust, and those 45 long Colt dummy rounds were provided by Thel Reed. What you are looking at in this photo is this styrofoam insert. This is the styrofoam insert that had the live round in it. This is the styrofoam insert that came out of the box labeled 45 long Colt dummies with the JS in the middle. Now, let's put it together. Our original evidence photo up here from October 10th, you can see this distinct uh, sort of cut in the styrofoam on that insert that is sitting on her leg on the 10th. You can see that the hole in the styrofoam in the second to the right at the top is dirty. You can see a little bit of grime you can see it right there, and you're going to take it into evidence, and you can look at it closer. You're going to see that there's some damage to the styrofoam separators between these two holes. And what do you know? It's right there. There's a little bit of damage to the styrofoam separators down here. You can see it in the photo on the right. You can look for yourself. It is right here. And what do you know? That silver primered round from October 10th is sitting in the exact same position that it was found on October 21st when the Sheriff's Department collected this box, took it into evidence, and photographed it. Ladies and gentlemen, we call that circumstantial evidence but that's a mountain of circumstantial evidence. Prop assistant duties versus armor duties on October 21st of 2021. Let's focus on that day. And listen, I'm not here to tell you that Rust Productions did the right thing when they hired on a part-time armorer and asked her 
to also spend her time doing props. I think everybody who has testified has said that was a really bad idea, and that's probably part of the reason that they're being sued by a whole bunch of different people. But on October 21st, this was simply not the case. It was not the case on that day. She had three hours in the morning waiting for the camera crew to arrive. She had every opportunity to go through that box of dummies, gee, that only had like 30 rounds in it. How long does it take to pull the round out of the box, shake it, and if it doesn't shake, look to see if it has a hole in it, put it back in the box, and do that to each and every one of them. How long does that exercise take? 10 minutes max? That's not hard. The other thing that is very important is Ms. Gutierrez didn't get pulled out of the church because she had to go focus on prop duties. She left the gun in the church contrary to all the industry standards uh, for armors on movie sets, for firearm safety on movie sets, and she went back out to her cart so that she could start doing other armor duties. She's getting her fanny pack filled up. Well, we've seen that. She's filling it with blanks. And we know they're about to do a turnaround. They're going to do this, this, uh, quick, this quick insert with Baldwin, and then they're going to do the shoot scene, the, the, the gunfire scene where they're using blanks, and the law enforcement have come into the church, and there's a shootout. So she goes to get ready for it. She just leaves the gun in there. As you heard from many witnesses, she would leave guns unattended all the time. There was nothing unusual about October 21st that caused her to be unable to stay in the church to properly perform her duties. She leaves the gun. She goes back out because for some reason, with the three hours of, uh, of free time that she had in the morning, she didn't get her fanny pack filled up. She didn't get herself ready for that turnaround. So she leaves the gun. Everybody's heard, armors don't leave the gun. Now, let's move over to our tampering with evidence charge. How is getting rid of a bag of cocaine tampering with evidence related to involuntary manslaughter. Well, on October 21st, 2021, the shooting occurs, the incident occurs. Um, Ms. Gutierrez understands that someone has been seriously injured. She does not yet know that that person is not going to live or has already died. She gets interviewed at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. I will say, surprisingly, two occasions after this incident where a helicopter had to come in, ambulances had to come in, um, Ms. Gutierrez, on two occasions after that incident, spoke about her concerns about her career. Wow. That gives you an idea that you are dealing with someone who is not particularly concerned about the health and safety of others. And her job was to be concerned about the health and safety of others. But on that day, she's just thinking about herself. She's put a lady in the hospital, a man in the hospital, she asks to be escorted to the bathroom. Corporal Hancock agrees to do that, and we have her on video on the way there expressing dismay about how this will affect her career. Ouch. After the interview, Hannah goes back to her hotel. Rebecca Smith goes to Hannah's room. She's been summoned by some other folks to try to sort of sit and visit and give Hannah some support. So Rebecca Smith goes to her room and Rebecca Smith is the person that tells Hannah that Helena Hutchins has now died. And you have to understand, 
in the mind of Hannah Gutierrez, this investigation went from this big to this big. Because the difference between shooting someone and them living and shooting someone and them dying is a really, really big difference. So she is told by Rebecca Smith, investigation just got giant and very, very serious. So after receiving that information, she offloads this bag of cocaine to Rebecca Smith. Rebecca Smith is a lady that's lived a life. She's used cocaine before, many years previous, but she's used cocaine. She knows what it looks like. She knows how it's packaged. And because she's a former addict, she tosses it in a trash can. When Mr. Bowles gets up here and says, I can't prove to you that it's cocaine, remember that when people destroy evidence to avoid prosecution, you don't have the evidence that they destroyed. They got rid of it. So I don't have to prove to you by some scientific uh, 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 drug test. I don't have to send that to the lab and get it tested. It's gone. That's the point to the charge. Now, let me, let me digress a little bit and, and run through a couple of things with you. What's all this testimony about this inertia puller? And how does that play into everything? Well, as you heard from Mr. Haig, an inertia puller is a device designed for one task. It disassembles live rounds. That's what it does. Somehow I think the defense got confused about what our potential theory was that we had a theory that Ms. Gutierrez was turning dummy rounds into live rounds. That was never our theory because that would require quite a bit of equipment. There's no question. But to do the reverse is a whole lot easier. So if you're out of dummy rounds or you're running low on dummy rounds and you've got some live rounds around, you could probably turn a dummy round, I'm sorry, you could turn a live round into a dummy round in five minutes. Why does an armor on a movie set bill for an inertia puller? Well, obviously she had one. Now, let's talk about the OSHA investigation. OSHA doesn't find any wrongdoing with individual employees, only employers. That's their job. They're just an agency that maintains workplace safety. Mr. Genoway confirmed when he was on the witness stand, it's true his memory was a little bad and Mr. Lewis had to refresh it for him, but he confirmed that Hannah's conduct on the set contributed to their findings that this was not a safe workplace. Please keep in mind that the OSHA investigation is not a criminal investigation. Critically and surprisingly, OSHA never interviewed Gabrielle Pickle. This is critically important because if, if they had interviewed her, they would have known the following things. Anna was granted 10 armor days out of the 12 filming days, not eight. That was right there in the cell phone records. The training days when Ms. Gutierrez is, is sending those messages saying, I want more training time, training days. She's not saying these actors, these adults need more training time. She specifically requested additional training time to train the child. And it was refused because first of all, it's a major liability issue. And second of all, the child was never going to fire a gun. So when she asked for the additional training days, they were denied. That's not the reason Helena Hutchins is dead.
keep in mind, Gabrielle Pickle uh, had a meeting with Hannah and offered her additional assistance so that she would be able to perform her duties effectively. She offered assistance uh, from some of the other folks there on set to try to give her some relief. And keep in mind that on a movie set, the armorer has autonomy with regard to gun safety. The, the, the OSHA finding that Rust Productions failed to properly supervise her is surprisingly incorrect because the armorer has no supervisor when it comes to weapons and gun safety on the movie set. Mr. Halls is just there to be a second pair of eyes. That's it. Now, I think there can be no question that Rust Productions was more than negligent when they hired Ms. Gutierrez because she was not anywhere close to being qualified for this job. In fact, if you recall, Gabrielle Pickle, to her credit, tried to get Ms. Gutierrez to implement a check-in and check-out system because two people had complained that there was a shotgun left unattended. People on the set were complaining about her. They went to production and said, hey, she's not supposed to do that. You can't just leave real guns laying around. So Gabrielle Pickle goes to Hannah Gutierrez, asks for a check-in, check-out system. Hannah Gutierrez says no. Hannah Gutierrez says it's too difficult, it's too much trouble. Gabrielle Pickle didn't prevent her from being safe. In that instance, she did the opposite. She tried to improve firearm safety on the set, but keep in mind, the armor has autonomy. So Gabrielle Pickle is not Hannah Gutierrez's boss when it comes to firearm safety. Ms. Gutierrez gets to do what she wants. Now I can only imagine that after this chain of cases, all of that will change. So the defense has taken a shotgun approach to this case. Seth Kinney is to blame. Well, no evidence of that. Sarah Zachary is to blame. No evidence of that. Dave Halls is to blame. He shouldn't have taken the gun from her. Um, and he didn't do a good safety check. Well, she is the autonomous decision maker with regard to gun safety. It's not that Dave Halls shouldn't have taken the gun from her. It's that she shouldn't have given him the gun and then turned around and walked away. Uh, the defense, Alec Baldwin is to blame for acting like a prima donna on the movie set and bossing people around. This is Hollywood, for heaven's sakes. I would imagine that's relatively common. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that his conduct was right. I am the person who indicted him. Alec Baldwin's conduct and his lack of gun safety inside that church on that day is something that he's going to have to answer for. Not with you and not today. That'll be with another jury on another day. Brian Norvell, the gentleman who goes and gets the prop cart and wheels it over and then puts his hand over the crime scene tape and picks up that dummy round and shakes it. You heard Mr. Bowles ask some questions that, 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 that are intended to make people think that uh, Mr. Norvell either took something off the prop cart or planted something on the prop cart. Well, keep in mind, <coughs> he doesn't have to plant live rounds because we've seen from the photographic evidence, those are there. They're floating around already. Um, so live rounds were on set. They were not planted by, by Brian Norvell. But this man is not a mystery to the state or the defense. 
I made him come in and sit down for a one and a half hour interview so that the defense could ask him any questions they wanted and they asked him none, not a single question. So what that means is that this is just all smoke and mirrors and deflection. They don't want the truth. We know the truth. You have seen it throughout this trial. And I will remind you that during one of the heated objection exchanges between myself and Mr. Bowles, you heard Mr. Bowles cry out that he was looking for the truth. Listen, I can bring a horse to water, but I cannot make him drink. If you want the truth, I'll bring the guy in. I'll make him available for you to talk to. Ask him some questions. Not a single one. It must have been that disgruntled camera crew. You mean the people who believed that safety on set was being compromised to such a degree that they left? That decision may very well have saved their lives. So the $60,000 question in this case, who brought the live rounds on set? You know the answer to that. I know the answer to that. I'm not telling you that Hannah Gutierrez intended to bring live rounds on set. I'm telling you that she was negligent. She was careless. She was thoughtless. She brought them on set and you know from the testimony you heard Sarah Zachary never saw her shake a dummy round. Dave Halls never saw her shake a dummy round. She didn't shake those dummy rounds. For all we know, those dummy rounds were floating around the set of the old way, and Nicolas Cage is lucky to have walked away with his life. So why does it matter that she brought live rounds on set? It goes to foreseeability. She had six, six live rounds on that movie set. The earliest date that I can track them for you is October 10th. We know that they were there from the 10th to the 21st. Six, and she failed to ferret them out for 12 days. What that means is that she wasn't shaking any dummy rounds. She wasn't testing anything. None of that stuff that her lawyers want you to think was so difficult. It was no, none of it was happening. It didn't happen the entire time. She didn't find any of them. And folks, if she's not checking the dummy ammunition during the pendency of the filming to make sure that those rounds that are designed to look like live rounds are in fact dummy rounds, this was a game of Russian roulette every time an actor had a gun with dummies. Sadly for Ms. Hutchins, her camera crew walked off set that morning and that required her to go into the church and operate the camera herself. And that's what she was doing when the live round that Ms. Gutierrez put in Mr. Baldwin's gun was expelled from that firearm and went all the way through her body. No one told Ms. Gutierrez to leave the church. No one called her out of the church. There wasn't a COVID protocol in place that prevented her from being in the church at that moment. You know from the production outfitter videos, she didn't care about her job. She let it all go. Mr. Bowles is going to argue to you that 
If Mr. Halls had just called Ms. Gutierrez back into the church, she would have done an additional safety check, and that live round would have been found, well, for heaven's sakes. We all know that if she had been called back into the church for an additional safety check, nothing would have changed. Her safety checks didn't consist of pulling the dummy rounds out of the cylinder, shaking them in front of the actor and the assistant director, showing them that they're dummy rounds, and putting them back in. No one ever saw her do that one single time, even though that's industry standard. And the reason it's industry standard is because you can't tell a dummy round by simply spinning a cylinder and looking at the primers unless they are dummy rounds without primers. And that's kind of an interesting fact. We know that six dummy rounds without primers were not loaded into that weapon because one of them turned out to be live and very clearly had a primer. Interestingly though, she had five dummy rounds without primers in her pocket in her pocket. All she had to do was put those in the gun, make sure that the sixth one either rattles or has a hole in it, and she's good to go. Because now, when you look, when the cylinder gets spun, you can see five of them without taking them out, that they don't have primers. They were in her pocket, and she didn't use them. Um, I am going to have another opportunity to speak with you, and when I speak with you uh, last, it won't be as long, I promise, um, and we will talk about some of our jury instructions then, but I do want to address some of the testimony from, the, from Dr. Gerald from OMI, uh, because Mr. Bowles is likely to make an argument that there was some sort of medical negligence. Uh, that contributed to Ms. H to, to Ms. Hutchins' death. And I want to talk to you a little bit about Dr. Gerald's testimony. Here are the lethal injuries. The lethal injuries. Blood loss from, from the wound. That was the primary lethal in injury. Her blood was leaking into her, in, into her abdominal cavity and a lot of it. And you saw those photographs, you saw the photographs of her clothing. There was a lot of blood. So the first lethal injury that comes from the gunshot it is blood loss associated with it. And the second one, if you recall from Dr. Gerald, uh, the, the wound to the, to the lung was also a lethal wound. Keep in mind, that bullet went into her body, it went through her rib, it severed her spinal cord, it punctured her lung, it came out the back of her shoulder, and a few hours later, Ms. Gutierrez is telling Corporal Hancock that she's worried about her career. If you think that person would have done a satisfactory safety check if she had been called back to the church, I am here to tell you that I strongly disagree. The astonishing lack of diligence with regard to gun safety is without question a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. Did Mr. Baldwin also contribute when he pointed the gun at people and pulled the hammer back and regardless of what he said to George Stephanopoulos, pulled the trigger? Yes, he is. And again, we'll deal with that another time. 
You don't escape accountability when you load a live round into a prop gun, tell the crew that it has dummy rounds in it, hand it off to an actor and leave the room because he manipulated it. That's the whole point. That was the whole point to him having it. Of course he was going to manipulate it. It's foreseeable. Everything is so completely foreseeable. Imagine I hand you a gun and I tell you that it's basically empty and I walk away when in fact I put live ammunition in it. Do you think an accident might happen? Do you think that accident is foreseeable? And listen, let's remember some of the testimony from Mr. Carpenter. Control is how we enforce gun safety. We do it with control. When she loses control, which she did repeatedly, anything goes. Anything goes there. I am going to complete the majority of the portion of my closing arguments with regard to the facts. The next portion will be with regard to the law. When I come back after Mr. Bowles has had an opportunity to address you, uh, we will be asking for justice today for Helena Hutchins. Thank you. Now, may we approach? Um, it's about a bathroom break. We're going to take a bathroom break. Okay. Okay. So please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Thank you. We'll All be rise. back at um, 10 of. Okay. Hey everybody, Law and Crimes, Jesse Weber here. Thank you so much for watching our coverage of the Russ trial of Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. You know, this case makes me think about how people get hurt in all kinds of situations that should not happen. And if you do get injured, it is so important to know your rights and whether you should be compensated. That's why I want to highlight the official sponsor of this week's live trial coverage, Morgan & Morgan. They are actually the largest injury law firm in the whole country. And if you're going to take on big insurance companies that often lowball insurance offers in these cases, you need a big firm that's willing to fight. I mean, in the past couple of months, Morgan & Morgan saw verdicts of $12 million in Florida, $6.8 million in New York, and $26 million in Philadelphia. Now, mind you, these are all considerably higher than the highest insurance offers for these accidents. But what also makes Morgan & Morgan so special is that they have completely modernized the process for their clients. They make it super easy because you submit your claim, you upload documents, you talk to your whole legal team, all on your smartphone. That's it. You can see if you have a case in just a few minutes. And in terms of price, you only pay them if you win. There's no upfront fee. Maybe it's not that surprising that 3 million people call them every year. So if you're ever injured in an accident, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. You can submit a claim in eight clicks or less without even having to leave your couch. To start your claim, visit forthepeople.com slash law and crime live.
All right, you may be seated. Mr. Bowles. Thank you, Your Honor. May I please court, counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I, I want to start also as I did when this began, which I want to sincerely thank you for your time and attention uh, and all of your work on this case. It's been hard. It's been a, a long case, and I, I want to thank you first. On behalf of Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, who this is extremely important for her, this, this case, and this is her day in court. And it's extremely important that the government rule out every reasonable doubt that there is in this case, because that is our standard in this country. Reasonable doubt is a concept, meaning if you have any reasonable doubt, if you have a reasonable doubt, we cannot convict people in this country. That's how it's set up. Because of that, the burden is on the prosecution, always stays in the prosecution, and so they have to rule out all of the reasonable doubts. In this case, and I'm going to talk about a lot of the evidence soon, but I just want to start with a summary. The prosecutor just presented to you a series of pictures, uh, and those were the pictures they paid the guy $10,000 to enlarge, uh, and they went through the pictures and they tried to show that there were silver primers and this is going to be definitive evidence that these live rounds had to be on set at a particular time. Let me tell you why there's reasonable doubt number one that they will never be able to rule out in this case. Sarah Zachary threw away rounds. She unquestionably threw away rounds after the shooting. That's undisputed. We have no idea what those look like. We will never have an idea what they look like, and that will never be able to be overcome. That one fact alone prevents that entire picture set up that was just shown to you from being accurate, from being real. Because we have no idea what those other rounds, whether they had silver primers, whether they were dummies, whether they were other types of, of dummies, what they look like, we have no idea. Fact two on the pictures. Seth Kenny told you he had gotten live rounds from Thel Reed that went to the 1883 set. Those live rounds were three types. There were three types of bullets. He then brought back around 125 of those of the three types. Now, the ones that the state seized, the prosecutors made a point of saying, these don't match the live rounds. However, we don't know what he had because they waited a month to go get them. It was over a month when they searched. And when Mr. Kenny brought in the rounds, he had been talking to the investigator about what was going on in the investigation. So we're never going to have an idea as to what Seth Kenny had and what he provided. Because he also told you in this trial he had no inventory system. He had no idea what was coming in and going out of his place. The place was a wreck. Look like a train had hit it. There's no way for somebody to, to really understand what they're putting in, what they're going out. And so he also said there were things that went onto the rust set that he hadn't inventoried, hadn't invoiced. He said that there were things that put on there that he didn't have invoiced. So here's the problem with that. We do not know that Seth Kenny only had those patinaed rounds. That's reasonable doubt. That's coming right from the government's witnesses, from Mr. Kenny. That part is unreconcilable. There is a reasonable doubt that will never leave this case on those two points, on the pictures and the live rounds. Now, Ms. Morrissey calls it dishonest for us to raise a question about Mr. Kenny. And I submit it's not dishonest at all because... They have the burden to investigate every possibility, uh, every aspect. As anybody in Ms. Gutierrez Reed's place would deserve and would want. Because their life is on the line as well, on felony charges, and it's the government's duty to rule out all these other things. Far from dishonest, what it is, is thoroughness, competence. Finding what happened with Seth Kenny, taking his fingerprints, 
taking his DNA, going through and searching earlier, doing that investigation, and finding out if indeed there is another possibility that they ruled out right away and they never wanted to look into because they rushed to judgment on Miss Gutierrez Reed from the very beginning. They singled her out on that set. They put her in a cop car, whether she asked or whether they put her in. Uh, she's in the cop car and she never leaves custody until after her statement. They singled her out and they rushed to judgment on her and that's what you've seen ever since. Ms. Morrissey says, and a camera crew, and she mocks things that we raise as possibilities on the idea that none of it can be possible except Ms. Gutierrez Reed is guilty. That is the only thing that can be possible because I say it. It's not how it works. Ms. Morrissey said, she indicted Mr. Baldwin. I indicted Mr. Baldwin. Actually, I think it's the state of New Mexico. That's not an individual person with that power. She also sat there when Miss Zachary was on the stand, and Miss Zachary, I'll remind you, got an immunity agreement. Miss Zachary was promised she would never be prosecuted. And Miss Morrissey stands up and says, There's no evidence against Miss Zachary. Well, then why was she given an immunity agreement? Why would she need immunity if there's nothing against Miss Zachary? She's given a mutiny agreement, and then she's told on redirect examination by Ms. Morrissey, remember, if you don't tell the truth, I can prosecute you. I will prosecute you. So Ms. Zachary doesn't tell the version of the truth that the government believes is true. We saw the threat in live court. You can't trust some of the witness testimony in this case, and that will raise a reasonable doubt as well, I submit, because of things like that. Because the lead investigator admits that she practiced her answers and questions with the prosecutor. That's something you can consider. Are you hearing everything? Or are you hearing a one-sided version that fits the narrative that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed has to be guilty because we picked her out first, and it's got to be her. Can't be Mr. Kenny, can't be the, anything else, any other possibility. Sarah Zachary has nothing to do with it. Even though we know unquestionably she threw away rounds after a uh, shooting. That's undoubtedly going to be evidence, but, but there's nothing on her, apparently. Second, these boxes. The idea that the boxes match. We heard testimony that these rounds were loaded in and out of these boxes daily. Nobody knows what was in them on the 13th, the 16th, the 21st, because the rounds were put in, they were taken out, and they were put in different boxes. So the boxes really are, don't matter. There's, there's reasonable doubt all over the place to the boxes, because we don't know what was in them three or four days before. It doesn't matter who brought them. Uh, the boxes are interesting because the government wants to match up the two, and they want to show the pictures that match, yet all the ones from PDQ Props have the same label, same font. They're from Joe Swanson. So those boxes are, are similar to the ones on set. So that, that part is, is not conclusive as well. The other part, when the government shows you video and video and video on, only on the 13th, and says Miss Gutierrez Reed was lax on safety. Well, again, you're seeing videos from short snippets of time on one day on an entire movie set, and then you're not seeing what Miss Gutierrez Reed may have done right after the clip. You're not seeing what might have happened right after that. The other thing that strongly rebuts all of the safety points Miss Morrissey is pointing out about Miss Gutierrez Reed is OSHA. Now, they try to downplay OSHA, but OSHA is a separate, independent state and federal agency that did a full investigation into the responsibility for safety failures on this set. And you can evaluate the credibility in your minds of, of Mr. Montoya, who took the stand, and how you thought he testified, whether you thought he was thorough, and how he answered questions. He, he interviewed quite a few people, and he reviewed a lot of information. 
their conclusion after that was done was that production was responsible. He said the root cause was production adopted a safety plan and it ended at the word adoption because they didn't do anything after that. They didn't respond to complaints that there were safety concerns. They didn't allow for more training and take the time to do that. They did not respond to the negligent discharges and deal with that. Mr. Halls talked to one of the guys briefly and that was all that happened. So you got to set that they're not allowing a time for inventory for the armor. They're not allowing time for them to clean their weapons or deal with their weapons. This is management. You just heard Mr. Pesh state that the first assistant director is the primary person for safety on that set. Dave Halls has been doing this 30 years. Somebody doing it 30 years has a responsibility and duty to step in when there's safety things going on, and he's on several of those videos. He has a responsibility to step in and say, hey, we're going to stop this. We're going to slow this down. We're going to have meetings. We're going to have additional safety training, and we're going to address this. Ms. Gutierrez Reed, come over here. We're going to do this, and we're going to talk to people. She also can come in and talk about that. And on those videos, they're both on the videos. But OSHA found, because of the lack of support, because she's a part-time armor, because she's not full-time, because she's not, there's not two of her, as Mr. Carpenter said, two is one and one is none. Well, here we didn't even have one. We had a half. So she's trying to run around and do various things. She's a half a, a, a job on a set with over 20 guns, and they want to lay the complete blame on her in this case as opposed to OSHA, who investigated as an official agency and made an official determination that this was production and management that was responsible. That's important. That's an important finding because they said all of this was caused safety-wise by management. As Mr. Sousa told you, the buck stops with production. The buck stops with production. As in any organization, it starts at the top. You don't go and take one of the lowest people on the call sheet after something bad happens, after the whole management team is just thrown safety aside in favor of money, in favor of speed, in favor of profit. You throw all of that aside because at the end, you've got a convenient fall person. You've got a convenient scapegoat. And she may not be the armor on some days, she's a props person, but she's certainly the armor when everything goes bad. You know why? Because despite OSHA's uh, findings that they were responsible, production, the guys that you saw come in, the producers, the big guys, they want to sail off into the sunset and go on about their business, finish the movie, make the money, because they've got the convenient fall person sitting right here. And all that has to happen is everybody has to gang up. Everybody has to have their talks after this happened and blame Hannah. So it has to happen. That's what happened in this case. You had a production company on a shoestring budget, an A-list actor that was really running the show. He was directing people in those clips, telling the camera person where to go, telling the armor where to, where to go. And then you had a situation where, at the end, they had somebody they could all blame. It didn't work out with OSHA because OSHA didn't buy it. OSHA said it was the higher-ups. So here we are in a criminal court where the government tries to pin all of it on Ms. Gutierrez Reed. And it's just not the truth. It's absolutely right. We do want the truth. We want the truth and all the facts that were found by OSHA to be considered. We wanted all of the facts that you don't have in this courtroom to be considered because that's the only fair way to do it, to resolve all reasonable doubt and to rule it out. If you don't have all the evidence, you can't rule out all of that reasonable doubt. I want to talk about foreseeability and I want to Play this for you.
Now you probably remember that. Um, that was the scene where Mr. Baldwin runs up the hill and <coughs> Cut is yelled. And right after Cut is yelled, he shoots. That's, I submit, reasonable doubt, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Because Mr. Baldwin went off script. He chose to fire after Cut was called. And you're going to see where he does later do the same thing in this tragic shooting. Mamie Mitchell told you on the stand, the script supervisor, that it was not in the script for Mr. Baldwin to point the weapon. It was not in the script for him to point the weapon. And we have to be very careful with facts when we're considering a a criminal case and the beyond the reasonable doubt standard. That's extremely important because Ms. Gutierrez Reed, nor anybody else, knew that Mr. Baldwin in that moment was going to point the weapon right at Helena and uh, Hutchins and Mr. Souza and do what he did. That is the concept of foreseeability. Now, Ms. Morrissey gave you an example of if I hand somebody a, a firearm and it's loaded and then they go and do something with it uh, and it hurts somebody. But here, what we had, we she did not know Mr. Baldwin was going to do what he did. No one, first of all, called her back into the church that he was using the gun at that time. She had given it to Halls to sit in in the church. Mr. Halls then gave it to Mr. Baldwin, and that is the conclusion of the lead investigator. That was what Baldwin said, and that is what Ms. Gutierrez Reed said. So Halls hands it to him. No one calls her back in to let her know Baldwin is doing that blocking scene. She doesn't know that's happening. The medic said she did not hear anybody call that out, first team, over the channel. So that's not getting put out. So Baldwin's doing an, another audible like he did on this video that you just saw. He's going off script. That defeats any idea that that was foreseeable to Miss Gutierrez Reed. If she doesn't know what's happening, she can't foresee it. That's a big part of the, inst- the instruction. The other part I want to talk about foreseeability and where this matters is live rounds. Now, live rounds in this type of situation has not happened in Hollywood. In the hundred years of Hollywood, this has not happened in a situation like we saw in this case. No one on that set foresaw, knew, or thought that live rounds were going to be on that set. No one. You did not hear one witness in this case, uh, even Miss Morrissey said, there was no evidence that Hannah knew about live rounds coming on or this, this was done. There's no evidence of that. Nobody thought live rounds were going to be on set. Mr. Souza um, told the doctors he couldn't believe it. He argued with them because it was inconceivable that live rounds would appear. Because of that, when you read the jury instructions, there's a concept in the involuntary manslaughter of an element of willful disregard of the rights of another. That word willful, and I'm going to go over it soon, means purposeful. That you willfully do something, you purposefully do something. What's impossible for the government to prove in this case... Can we approach... Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk about willful more in a moment when we get there. But it cannot be willful if Hannah does not know there's live rounds. And nobody did. So she did not do something willfully knowing that Baldwin could foreseeably hurt somebody with this firearm. Because she didn't know it was live. And let me give you an example. 
um, it's akin to uh, a nurse, let's say in a hospital, who the pharmacy mislabels uh, a drug. And let's say it comes to her and, and somebody's ordered it be administered to a patient. She then administers it not knowing that it's a fatal drug of some other type. The pharmacy's mislabeled it. The patient passes. It's the same situation as we have here where the government would be saying the nurse committed involuntary manslaughter. No, that's not true because she did not know what happened. It's like a long time ago um, when the Tylenol capsules were laced with, with cyanide, way back in the 80s or somewhere around there. The, there was no prosecution of the pharmacies that didn't know about this, that were tainted by it. It's the same type of situation we have here with the nurse. Ms. Gutierrez-Reed did not know there were live rounds, and she was entitled to rely on production buying dummies and the boxes labeled dummies. She's entitled to rely on that, and that reliance is reasonable. So she cannot foresee a live round. Now, I want to talk next about Ms. Gutierrez-Reed's statements to law enforcement. You saw her first statement. She didn't have a, an attorney. She did waive her rights and answer her question. She had not been advised at that time. Ms. Hutchins had passed. And she came in a second time and answered all questions. The reason why I say that is she was cooperative. She was trying to assist in what this investigation, uh, what they were investigating. Now, Corporal Hancock, Corporal Hancock never fully investigated the source of the live rounds. And she told you that she focused on people on the set. So again, in ruling out reasonable doubt and where those live rounds came from, we have not done that in this case because there was never a full investigation as to the source of the live rounds. Let me give you an example. The state never called Joe Swanson. And it's kind of remarkable because Joe Swanson was the original source of where these came from. He's also the JS in all the boxes. So the idea that the person where it originated, you wouldn't call that person and get some more information is, is interesting. But more than that, it leaves a huge hole in the origin of the live rounds. Let me tell you what else it is. Seth Kinney's fingerprints and DNA were never taken. Seth Kinney talked to Corporal Hancock 40 times or more. They supplied information back and forth. And he starts making you wonder about what's going on and why I'm, I'm called dishonest for raising the possibility that maybe Mr. Kinney was the source. Because he's pretty tight with law enforcement in this case, obviously. They don't do a prop search warrant until six days after the incident, and that was Corporal Hancock and the rest of the sheriffs. They don't search Mr. Kenny's business until over a month after. They never ask the FBI to check live rounds for fingerprints or DNA. And so we will not know if Mr. Kenny's fingerprints or anybody else's would have ever appeared on those live rounds on set because they didn't get that evidence. Bryce Ziegler, I want to tell you a little bit, remind you a little bit about his testimony, and that's Mr. Ziegler. Um, he talked about Baldwin's revolver being single, single action. You have to cock it, and then uh, every time you want to shoot it. He testified about breaking that firearm. They actually destroyed the firearm um, after testing that was approved by the sheriff by hitting that with a hammer. He talked about that you can't determine a live round from a picture. And that's the other point I think is important to consider when considering the picture analysis. Now, the Latin print examiner the, uh, examined various things, but she did not examine anything uh, Seth Kenny wise There's no analysis on the cartridges from the prop cart and found eight FBI employee prints. Mr. Gillette, 
on the the powder testing. Only tested 11 rounds from Seth Kenny. Again, we know that he brought back 125 <coughs> from the group that went to 1883. And I also want to remind you about 1883, some of those were Starline brass rounds. And some of those, he said, had silver primers. So when we get to the set, the live rounds are Starline brass, and they have silver primers. It's a continuous chain that could have been traced from Del Reed all the way to Seth Kenny all the way back to the set. But they did not do that thorough investigation, and that's reasonable doubt they have not ruled out. The dummies, again, I submit this is another area of reasonable doubt. <clears throat> Witnesses testified this set contained a dangerous mix of dummies. They were dangerous because it was impossible for the armor and prop master to hear and rattle all of the dummies, uh, especially under pressure, rushing, and noise on the set. You saw there was a lot of wind that day on the lapel. There's people running around. There's, I think at one point somebody said 200 people. There's all kinds of things going on. Um, and despite that, Mr. Haig uh, indicated in a quiet office he could not hear one of the dummies when it's rattled. That's dangerous because when you're trying to do it quickly, when there's a lot of noise, it may be a dummy. Um, it may not. You can't hear it rattle. Seth Kenny, again, mentioned in this case that he always rattle tested his rounds. And he made sure they're dummies. He told you all that. Well, the problem, the, even the box that they say was Seth Kenny's and the rounds that came out of it, there was one round, if you remember, that was gunked, and it didn't shake. That round had to be sent to the FBI to be broken apart and to be checked to see if it was live. So if he truly is that thorough and shaking, he missed that round. Now the producers, they had oversight over the budget team. They didn't know where the funds were set aside for the armor. They were on location for filming and they were fined the statutory maximum by OSHA for managerial safety violations. Again, OSHA found that the management team are the ones responsible. And yet we're here with Ms. Gutierrez Reed the person on trial for the felony offenses. Sherilyn Schaefer was the medic on set. You recall she did not have a chest seals. Um, she, I think, was doing the best she could with the equipment that she had, but she didn't have the um, complete equipment to deal with a gunshot wound. She also indicated she never heard anyone call out use of a gun before the fatal shooting. Mamie Mitchell, I touched on this earlier. Most important thing Ms. Mitchell said was that it was not in the script for Baldwin to point the firearm. That goes directly to the element when you read the jury instructions and you all go back in to deliberate. Uh, that goes to foreseeability and whether or not anybody can foresee the moments Mr. Baldwin pointing the gun, using it as a, a pointer. He's up on the hill shooting after cut and then he's shooting uh, pointing the gun when he's not supposed to in scenes. David Halls, um, David Halls was the first assistant director, uh, as you remember, and he was in charge of overall safety. Now he got a misdemeanor, uh, six months unsupervised probation, even though he was in charge of overall set safety. He never raised any concerns, and in fact I think he said Hannah did a great job as armor. He indicated he did not hand the gun to Baldwin, but the sheriff contradicted this, so did Hannah, and so did Mr. Baldwin. Uh, and that was essentially Mr. Hall's testimony. Sarah Zachary, I remind you, she threw away rounds on set after the shooting, took items off the prop card. Now, she worked for Seth Kenny, and she texted and called him right after the shooting. She, one of her texts, she indicated she had said she was talking to Alec Baldwin and trying to keep her facts straight. She mentioned that she had loaded firearms on set. She picked up ammunition from Kenny at PDQ. I'll remind you in the testimony that Sarah Zachary and Hannah Gutierrez-Reed went to Kenny's place before production started, and he had given them ammunition, leathers, and firearms. 
So again, we don't know exactly what Mr. Kenny may have supplied to this set because it's not inventoried, it's not all invoiced. I also remind you about Sarah Zachary when you're considering her credibility and her testimony. She had the text where she wanted Hannah to go to jail and she's given complete immunity. Now Seth Kenny, again, I, I mentioned this, he supplied the leathers, guns, and ammo before arrest began. He had no inventory system. And I, we attached some pictures to the right that you can look at in the, the jury room about his place. It was an absolute mess. There was stored lime, live ammo in the bathroom. And one of the things I think was important to remind you of is he actually called Joe Swanson and had a conversation with him. And after he gets off the call, his first words are, shit, shit, shit. And so that's something as an investigator you would think after he does that, maybe I should call Joe Swanson and see what's happening. See what that means. That reasonable doubt has not been ruled out. I went over this um, on the 1883 set and he brought 125 uh, rounds back. Mr. Carpenter, I want to remind you, he was a state's expert armor. One of the most important points he said was two is one and one is none. And here we didn't have uh, a properly staffed armor uh, component to the set. Luke Haig, he said the live rounds on set were reloads. Um, he could not hear the dummy rattle in the quiet office and he said Mr. Bowen violated basic safety rules. Karen Kuhn, you may remember, was the photographer. She said the armor was checking guns before when she was present. And she also made a comment about Mr. Baldwin that on the day she was taking questions, I believe she said on the 21st, he told her to get out of his personal space and said something in a, in a manner that kind of goes along with how he was on the set. Um, Mr. Souza was kind about it. He said he had a strong personality, but you can see it in the videos and you can see how Mr. Baldwin was acting. Rebecca Smith, I want to talk about the tampering. She said that that she hadn't used cocaine in 31 years. She saw a baggie inside a baggie for approximately five seconds. She didn't know if it was cocaine or meth or something else. Now she admitted at the end she was guessing. And we also know that the substance in the baggie was never tested. And so there, the only evidence you have of narcotics in this case is a guess. Now, Ms. Morrissey in her closing indicated that well, of course we don't have the evidence. The whole thing is throwing it away. Well, you have to prove first that it was evidence. So in a normal tampering case when, let's say, a firearm is thrown away and we know a firearm was used and somebody throws a firearm away, we know that was a firearm. So we know that would be evidence in a case involving a shooting. Here, we have an unknown substance. Again, they have to rule out all of the reasonable doubt by that. It's not enough to say it's probably something under a criminal standard. It's probably cocaine in that bag because Ms. Smith says it is. If it even happened, we don't even know this happened. The government hasn't established that except through her testimony. We don't know if there was a bag. We don't know if this actually was passed. And that's their burden. It, let's say it did happen, that you, you believe it did happen. It's not enough to say what was probably in that bag. They have the burden to rule it out beyond a reasonable doubt that it couldn't have been anything else. And she's already calling it in her testimony potentially multiple substances, cocaine, methamphetamine, or possibly something else. So she's not even certain about what it is. Without a, a, a test, without something presumptive to tell you on a test, there's no way of telling what was in that bag. And it's not enough in a criminal case. OSHA we've talked about in detail. And I just want to remind you the root cause they found, they attributed all the responsibility for safety issues to management. Mr. Elliott, uh, he was defense expert investigator. He had an extensive law enforcement experience, if you recall, in APD and military. 
One of his big points was Mr. Baldwin was not segregated at the beginning, even though he was the known shooter. Hannah was segregated right away. Again, they zeroed in on her uh, in the, the rush to have her identified. He indicated there was 20 or so key witnesses not identified and segregated. And the problem with that is they can get their stories together and they can uh, change their stories, they can have their memories altered. We know this happened in this case because after the incident, Mr. Baldwin is talking to Sarah Zachary. Uh, she's, he's texting and talking to her. Seth Kenny's talking to Sarah Zachary. Mr. Halls is talking to Baldwin after. And so we don't have all the information they're talking about, but we do know they're coordinating, they're talking. The only one not in that group uh, was, was Hannah. And again, this was the idea. We've got to circle the wagons and we've got to pick out the person that's going to take the fall for everything that's happened here. That's Hannah. That's who they got. Law enforcement failed to follow up on the origin of the live rounds and their delayed search warrants caused problems with missing evidence. P.J. Pesh testified just this morning. Um, he had said, like everybody else, he's never seen in 35 years an armor split duties with props. It's not possible for one person to keep track of so many firearms. And he indicated it's important to give the armor adequate time and resources, which OSHA said as well. She was not given that to do her job. I want to talk to you about the law that the judge instructed you on, and, and that is the law. What the judge uh, told you about is what has, we, we have to follow in terms of evaluating this. The law presumes the defendant to be innocent. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense. The kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act in the graver and more important affairs of life. A doubt based on reason and common sense. So what the government has to do is rule out every reasonable doubt you may have based on reason and common sense. Or in this country, we don't convict people. That's the standard. And again, I go back to where I started at the beginning. If they didn't rule out the reasonable doubt on Miss Zachary throwing away the rounds, that is always going to be there. Because their theory based on you can identify these pictures and we know exactly what was on the set and what remained on the set, and what we will never know that because some of them were thrown away. And we didn't get all of Seth Kinney's rounds. We're never going to know that. Other areas of reasonable doubt, I've gone over the top two, top three. The prop cart was tampered with. Uh, we know that right after the incident, another individual moved it. Now, Lieutenant Benavides said he had eyes on uh, the entire time. But if you saw that video, you can make up your mind what you believe. Um, ladies and gentlemen, his camera appeared to be pointed right into the vehicle. And the individual getting the cart was way off in the other direction. He said he had his head turned. But you all can decide uh, what you think about that. The prop cart, there was unquestionably items taken from it. We don't know exactly what those are. That is another area of reasonable doubt that the government has not ruled out. You've had witnesses say throughout the trial, you can't tell live ammo from a picture. And the reason is that the FBI said it has to be disassembled and you have to open it up because there's powder in it. If there's not powder in it, then it's not live. OSHA stated the root cause of all safety failures was management. OMI ruled this to be an accident, not a homicide. You heard evidence about the esophageal intubation was ineffective to provide oxygen to Helena. This also was a situation in this case where multiple lawsuits have been filed and you can evaluate their testimony, those people who have filed lawsuits, with care and caution because they've got an interest potentially in what's happening in this case by being involved in lawsuits. 
Involuntary manslaughter, uh, you're going to have that instruction when you go back. That is the um, charge that the, the, Her Honor has read to you. She's given you the law on this. I want to focus you on a couple key points. The government has the burden to show each of these elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, the elements are the numbered items. What that means is if you all have reasonable doubts on any of these elements, Hannah cannot be convicted. And I want to focus you in on element three, that Hannah acted with a willful disregard. Again, you go back to willful disregard, the nurse example, and the idea that if somebody doesn't know, I mean, that could be the same thing with a nurse on trial for involuntary manslaughter, but if she doesn't know the drug was mislabeled, you cannot hold her criminally accountable for something like that. It's the same thing in this case, because no one knew there were live rounds. So she did not act willfully in anything that happened that day. In loading the, the firearm, this was a nor another day everybody thought on set. Loading the firearms, running to different things, doing the duties, Nobody's calling her back in for the blocking scene. Mr. Baldwin's doing something on his own. Nobody in the wildest dreams thought there was a live round. And because of that, the next element is that Hannah Gutierrez Reed that caused the death. I submit to you that what caused uh, her to pass was Mr. Baldwin going off script and pointing the weapon. Now, he didn't know uh, there was a live round in there either. He didn't know. Again, he's in the same position that nobody knew there was ever going to be a live round on that set. But the only the only ultimate act is this pointing of that weapon. Miss Gutierrez wasn't in the church. She didn't point that weapon. She didn't pull it. Nobody called her back in. And because of that, those two elements, I submit to you, have not been proven on involuntary manslaughter. And they have to be. The government has to resolve all your reasonable doubts about that, or they don't. You cannot. Uh, we cannot convict. Mental state and willful disregard, uh, and that is going to be in your in your instructions. For you to find the defendant acted negligently in this case, you must find that the, the defendant acted with willful disregard. And and so the, again, that's the terminology: is willful disregard. You're also going to be instructed, the court instructed you, Her Honor, on negligent use of a firearm. And that is a, a lesser included offense of the involuntary manslaughter. Uh, so when you go back and deliberate, you will have uh, this in front of you as well, whether Miss Gutierrez Reed endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. And again, the language is acted with willful disregard. That's what has to be proven under that charge <clears throat> for her, for you to resolve all of your reasonable doubts. Tampering with evidence, I think this is a, a real stretch, and it's a, it is a real stretch, and, and you talk about guessing. This one, they have to prove the defendant hit a bag of cocaine. Well, the only witness they have to it said it was either cocaine or meth or something else. So just just by the testimony alone, the beginning of that, you can't. There's no way of knowing it was a bag of cocaine. It's just impossible. There has to be reasonable doubt on that by the government's own witness. Their only witness. No law enforcement testing. There's nobody else. That this this is absolutely unproven in this case. And you don't even have to get to element two because element one is not even close to having, having been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Proximate cause, it's a legal term, but it's something the government has to prove as well. And this is where you get into that the passing was a foreseeable result of Hannah Gutierrez's act. The act was a significant cause of the death and the language I want to focus you in on, in a natural and continuous chain of events uninterrupted by an outside event. What these mean, and legal, these are the legal terminology, what it means is that what Hannah Gutierrez did had to be a foreseeable result. But again, 
that caused her death. But again, without her knowing that there was a live round, that's impossible to meet that standard. She did not have that knowledge, and there's no witness that came in here in this courtroom in two weeks to say she had that knowledge. Without it, nothing she did. She has that willful disregard because she just doesn't know. Now, was there an outside event as well? There was an outside event. There's two outside events. Whoever put the live round on set and then Mr. Baldwin in the end going off script and doing what he did. Those are outside events outside of Miss Gutierrez Reed's control that she didn't know was going to happen. That breaks any idea uh, and there's reasonable doubt that she had anything to do ultimately with Helena Hutchins' death. Miss Gutierrez Reed was not a significant cause as a result of her death because of the reasons I've mentioned to you. Another instruction Her, Her Honor gave you is that negligence of a third person, again, I'm going to highlight the language, if it breaks the foreseeable chain of events. Um, again, the foreseeable chain of events on that set is you have dummy rounds, you have blank rounds, and then you have um, an orderly progression with how those are being used. Here we had a completely unforeseeable live round, uh, six live rounds that were on set nobody could foresee, and then we have Mr. Baldwin's action in the end. Those were both unforeseeable to Miss Gutierrez Reed. The judge instructed you on, you all are the sole judge of the facts. You all are deciding the facts, ladies and gentlemen, and your verdict should not be based on speculation, guess, or conjecture. It goes back to the tampering charge. Um, it goes back to some of the other aspects the government has told you. In this country, we can't decide and convict people on guesses. And that's a lot of what they've asked you to do in several areas, to guess, to assume, to speculate. It's not sufficient to convict people in this country to guess. It's not. And that's what they brought you and they've asked you to do on the tampering and other aspects of their charges. And that's not sufficient. Ladies and gentlemen, Hannah is not guilty on all the counts because of the law that Her Honor has given you. When you apply that law and you apply the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt, she could not anticipate what Baldwin would do. It was not in the script. It was not foreseeable. Management was responsible for safety failures and not Hannah. There's zero evidence of cocaine. There's no testing. And again, I go back to the idea that Hannah is a scapegoat for all the management failures. They do hope she gets convicted, so they're all exonerated. They can move forward. They can finish that movie like Mr. Sousa said they did and make their money. But as he also told you, the buck always stops with production, and it's their responsibility. In any organization, it goes from the top down. And that's where the responsibility lies in this case. That's what OSHA said, and that's also the truth. And the truth is important. Because justice for Helena does not mean injustice for Hannah. Does not mean injustice for Hannah. It does not mean they get to steamroll her and they get to come in and spin their version of facts and they get to call it truth. Because that's not truth. Truth is bringing you Ladies and gentlemen, everything they can. Justice is bringing you everything they can. Justice is not mocking theories that could come true, that might have been the case. Justice is not laughing in court during some of our exchanges. And you can evaluate that as to their credibility, whether that was professional whether if she didn't take court seriously, does she take the investigation seriously? 
I submit she did not. And so they can't come in here with a straight face and mock us and criticize us and tell you they have given you enough to convict her behind a reasonable doubt because they haven't. Thank you. State's reply. Again, while the gentlemen are setting up the uh, Almo for me. Hannah didn't know there was a live round on set. I agree. If Hannah knew there was a live round on set and she loaded it into a prop gun and it was used to kill Helena Hutchins, she wouldn't be charged with involuntary manslaughter. She'd be charged with second degree murder. She'd be charged with first degree depraved mind murder. This is an involuntary manslaughter charge because she didn't know there were live rounds on set and the reason she didn't know was through her own negligence, her own recklessness, her own willful disregard for the safety of other people. That willful disregard, that lack of care for the safety of other people that you have seen throughout this trial, it is shocking. For Mr. Bowles to come up to this podium and say it wasn't foreseeable that Alec Baldwin was going to go off script and pull the hammer and pull the trigger, he showed you a video of Alec Baldwin going off script. Alec Baldwin went off script. Hannah Gutierrez knew it. She was there. Hannah Gutierrez knew that Baldwin was loose. She knew it. She didn't do anything about it, even though it was her job. It was her job. It is her job to say to an A-list actor, if in fact that's what you want to call him, um, hey, you can't behave that way with those firearms. That is her job. That is what they pay her for. That is the job that she applied for. That is the job that she accepted. Foreseeability. You want to talk about off script? Just remember those videos of the stuntman. That's not within the script. She was there. She watched it. She knew these people would go off script. You know she didn't check the rounds. If she checked the rounds, they wouldn't have been floating around that movie set the entire time, undetected. give you everything we've got. You have absolutely everything we have. This law enforcement team and this team of prosecutors have reviewed thousands and thousands and thousands of photos and thousands of videos. We have interviewed countless people, many of whom you didn't even hear from. We can't stay here forever. You have absolutely everything you need. One of the amazingly shocking things about this case to me has always been, and it's to Detective Hancock's credit, a defense attorney with his own agenda, no question, comes to her and says, it's Seth Kenny, it's Seth Kenny, it's Seth Kenny. 
That's his job. Okay, let's make that clear. That's Mr. Bowles' job. He gets Hannah's dad to say, it's Seth Kenny, it's Seth Kenny, it's Seth Kenny. Rather than ignore them, she gets a search warrant. She took his speculative agenda, presented it to a judge, got a search warrant, and searched that man's property. And oh my heavens, what did they find? They found exactly what Thel Reed said they would find. They found live ammunition with semi-wad cutter projectiles. You have everything you have, you, you, you have everything we have, you have everything you will ever need to convict her. This is 100% foreseeable. Hannah Gutierrez is not a scapegoat. Hannah Gutierrez is not being treated as a scapegoat. Mr. Halls was charged criminally. To his credit, he took an early plea and he got the benefit of that. Mr. Baldwin has now been indicted. Everyone with criminal culpability has been criminally charged in this case. She's not being scapegoated. She is being treated like everyone else. She is not being given a break because she's a woman. She is not being given a break because she's young. Because that's not how the law works. Let me just review my notes real quick. And as I promised you, I am going to try to speed this up for you. Please keep in mind, Mr. Bowles comes up to the podium and says, Sarah Zachary threw rounds away. She did. Obviously she did. She admitted it. She told law enforcement that she did it. And rather than try to prosecute her for tampering with evidence, for panicking and throwing some rounds away, she agreed to come in and testify. And her agreement is that she must testify truthfully. And she testified truthfully. You want to know why we don't have an inertia puller in evidence? Why we don't have a box of dummies that Ms. Gutierrez said she brought on set? She said she brought two boxes. We've only got one. You want to know why? Because she went to the prop truck on October 23rd, got access to it, took a bunch of gun belts, and a couple of boxes. Your Honor, I don't object. Where were we? She took stuff out of the prop truck. She took gun belts. You heard from Sarah Zachary that those were gun belts that she brought from another movie set that were already loaded with dummy rounds. Who knows what was in them? So I want to make sure that we understand what reasonable doubt means. Reasonable doubt means the doubt must be reasonable. It is not a reasonable doubt to cast suspicion on Brian Norvell. It is not a reasonable doubt to cast suspicion on Seth Kinney. All investigative leads were exhausted. He simply didn't do anything wrong. You want to talk about scapegoating? That's the guy that got scapegoated. The doubt must be reasonable. 
And I don't have to prove this case beyond all possible doubt. If that is what the law required, my heavens, we live in a world of infinite possibilities. The government would never be able to prove a case beyond all possible doubt. We'd have to have a video of absolutely everything that took place. It's not the standard, and it doesn't have to be the standard. So when you're back there and you're talking about doubt, make sure it's a reasonable one under this set of circumstances. You know, Mr. Bowles says to you, these production outfitters were just from one day. That's right. All that happened in one day. Imagine what all the other days were like. That was one day. Mr. Balls is right. The crew didn't believe there were live rounds on set. They believed that she was going to do her job. They believed that she did her job. This isn't Seth Kinney's responsibility to inventory rounds, although he did it. That wasn't his responsibility. Rust Productions didn't provide all of the dummy rounds to the set of this movie. You know from her own statements she brought two boxes on herself. We're not living in an alternate reality. All right. Let's go through these. I'll go through them relatively quickly. When you all go back into the jury deliberation room, you will have your own copy. Uh, so you certainly will have a copy to reference. Um, these are some of the instructions that are important to us. Your verdict should not be uh, based on sympathy or prejudice. Sympathy or prejudice. Huh? It's not showing on the screen. Oh. Oh, I see. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. So it can't be based on sympathy or prejudice. And for any of you who are feeling sympathetic because she is young and she is maybe inexperienced, although by her own statement to Detective Hancock, she would tell you she wasn't. You all are on this jury because during voir dire, you agreed to follow the law. And I will ask you to do it right now. If you had said during voir dire, I can't follow the law, I feel too sympathetic, you wouldn't be here. And if you can't follow the law, you can probably excuse yourselves. I'm going to skip that one. That's an easy one. You must not concern yourselves with the consequences of your verdict. That is the law. That is the law that you agreed to follow. That is the law that you are required to follow. Hannah Gutierrez endangered the safety of another by, hand by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. There can be absolutely no doubt. That happened. Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by her actions. Yeah, she knew. This was completely foreseeable. She was trained in firearms. She knows what we all know. Guns can kill you. You gotta be really careful. Her act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. Well, 
12a is the alternative theory. And so let me explain to you that 12 and 12a are alternatives. You must find, you must make a decision about guilt or innocence unanimously to the count, not to the alternatives. So six of you can say, I think she's guilty of 12, but not 12A. Another six of you can say, we think she's guilty of 12A, but not 12. Done. You're done. Hannah Gutierrez loaded live ammunition into a firearm. Yes, she certainly did. She told the police she did. She failed to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition. Of course, you know that. She didn't do it just once. She did it numerous times. She acted with willful disregard for the safety of others, without question. So you are being presented with what's called a lesser included offense. And I will remind you the instructions that the judge read you at the beginning. Um, your first job is to see if you can agree on involuntary manslaughter. If you find her guilty of involuntary manslaughter on either alternative, you do not move on to this misdemeanor. It's done. If you find her not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then you get to move on to the misdemeanor. You've heard a lot about that, I'll skip it. This is what we call a general criminal intent instruction and I want to just make sure that you understand this instruction only applies to the tampering with evidence. It does not apply to the involuntary manslaughter because she is charged with negligent homicide, not intentional. Very importantly, are the proximate cause jury instructions. These jury instructions are what allows you to find Ms. Gutierrez guilty, even though Mr. Baldwin may have also been a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. So let's go through it. The death was a foreseeable result of Hannah Gutierrez placing a live round into a firearm. Of course it was. The act of the defendant was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. The defendant's act was a significant cause of death if it was an act which, in a natural and continuous chain of events, uninterrupted by an outside event, resulted in the death and without which the death would not have occurred. She brought a bunch of live rounds on set, accidentally, but negligently. She loaded one of them into a prop gun, and this was after they were loaded into Jensen Ackles gun belt and Alec Baldwin's holster. And she told Dave Halls, this is a cold gun, he told the crew it's a cold gun. At that point, everyone certainly assumed that there wasn't a live round. She knew Baldwin would go off script. She didn't have prop duties to tend to. She walked out. And even if she had been there, it wouldn't have made a difference because you have seen the incredible lack of control that she exercised as the only person on the movie set in charge of firearms. 
There is no intervening event. If you think the intervening event is that Baldwin manipulated the gun, that was, that's the whole purpose of the prop. He's going to manipulate it. You saw a bunch of other actors do it. Very importantly, there may be more than one significant cause of death. If the acts of two or more persons significantly tr contribute to the cause of death, each act is a significant cause of death. If you think Baldwin's act was a significant cause of death, that's okay. You can still convict her. Jury instruction 20. If you find the, neglig the negligence of a person other than the defendant was the only significant cause of death or constitutes an intervening cause that breaks the foreseeable chain of events, the defendant is not guilty. Well, that's not this case. She brought the live rounds on set. She put a live round in a prop gun. That's the reason that Ms. Hutchins is dead. One of at least two reasons. I will again thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I know that this has been hard work for you folks. Um, I will ask you to find Ms. Gutierrez guilty of involuntary manslaughter <clears throat> and tampering with evidence. And I will ask you to bring some justice to Helena Hutchins. Thank you. All right, thank you. Instruction number 22, I will now ask you to retire to the jury room to begin your deliberations. You will be provided a copy of the jury instructions and the exhibits introduced as evidence will be made available to you. Prior to beginning your deliberations, you will need to select one of you to act as four person. That person will preside over your deliberations and will speak for the jury here in court. Forms of verdict have been prepared for your use. You will take these forms to the jury room when you have reached a unanimous agreement as to your verdict the four person will sign the forms which express your verdict. You will then return all forms of verdict, these instructions, and any exhibits to the courtroom. There are 12 that deliberate. There are four alternates on this jury given the long uh, length of this jury. Uh, keeping with the privacy, I'm going to pass this instruction um, down with uh, the help of Ryan. You're going to look if this is one of your names and you are one of the alternates. What I'm going to ask um, the bailiff to do is to first take the alternates out so they can get their belongings, and I'm going to ask you to meet me down at the end of the hallway to ex explain. Just, uh, I hate to tell alternates they're alternates because they've been paying so close to the evidence, um, and so uh, just to talk talk with you, and then um, and thank you, and then right along um, on your right on your clip will be. Um, the jurors themselves, okay, and the jurors will go into into the room. So I'll need the aid of both of them. But first, let me pass this piece of paper over to you. Look down here. There's four names. See if one of them is yours, and you're an alternate. at the bottom.
All right, so uh, follow the, um, the alternates follow Ryan. I'll meet you down at the end of the hallway after you get your belongings, and then you'll follow with the jury. All right, we're in recess. I'll be back in, but um, we're in recess. You can get going with your exhibits and things like that.
Hey everybody, Law and Crimes, Jesse Weber here. Thank you so much for watching our coverage of the Rust trial of Hannah Gutierrez Reed. You know, this case makes me think about how people get hurt in all kinds of situations that should not happen. And if you do get injured, it is so important to know your rights and whether you should be compensated. That's why I want to highlight the official sponsor of this week's live trial coverage, Morgan and Morgan. They are actually the largest injury law firm in the whole country. And if you're going to take on big insurance companies that often lowball insurance offers in these cases, you need a big firm that's willing to fight. I mean, in the past couple of months, Morgan & Morgan saw verdicts of $12 million in Florida, $6.8 million in New York, and $26 million in Philadelphia. Now, mind you, these are all considerably higher than the highest insurance offers for these accidents. But what also makes Morgan & Morgan so special is that they have completely modernized the process for their clients. They make it super easy because you submit your claim, you upload documents, you talk to your whole legal team, all on your smartphone. That's it. You can see if you have a case in just a few minutes. And in terms of price, you only pay them if you win. There's no upfront fee. Maybe it's not that surprising that 3 million people call them every year. So if you're ever injured in an accident, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. You can submit a claim in eight clicks or less without even having to leave your couch. To start your claim, visit forthepeople.com slash law and crime live.
Hey there, everybody. Welcome to our live show. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. So we are coming to the end of the Hannah Gutierrez-Reed trial out of New Mexico. Closing arguments happened today. The jury began their deliberations at around 3.19 p.m. Eastern time. I don't suspect that they're going to come back any minute, but who knows? Who knows? I've been surprised before. Now, this jury is seven men, five women. And this, of course, is the trial of the former armor who's been facing involuntary manslaughter charges and a tampering with evidence charge, all connection with the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Now, we know that on October 21st, 2021, a live round was discharged from a prop gun that was being handled by actor and producer on the film, Alec Baldwin. He is facing his own involuntary manslaughter charges. He got himself in trouble when he previously and famously said he didn't pull the trigger, but forensics forensics and ballistics testing indicated that it would have been impossible for the gun to go off in those circumstances without pulling the trigger. He's facing a separate trial in July. We plan to cover it here on Law and Crime. Now, I want to get more into what's happening here, and I'm going to get more into the substance of this case. But before I do that, my main question is, what do you guys think? After everything that has been presented by the prosecution and the defense, and you heard the closings today, do you think Hannah Gutierrez is at fault? Do you think she is criminally responsible? Do you think the jury will find her guilty? What about Alec Baldwin? I tell you right now, I'm planning on doing a show about all of the incriminating evidence that came out against him during the course of this trial, because this case has a lot of intricate details, witnesses, and I'm curious to hear what all of you think. So. You can share your thoughts and comments in the live chat that we have up right now. I'm going to be taking your questions, addressing your opinions from there, but also make sure to make sure that your message is noticed and doesn't get lost in the mix. You can send a super chat our way. That's the best way to get your chat. No- you get your question noticed. We're going to get it right up there. So super chats really the best way to get your message up there. All right. So as we go through this, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the case. So the prosecution here has two alternative theories of involuntary manslaughter here. The first is that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed endangered the safety of another by handling the gun in a negligent manner, that she should have known the danger that she was creating, that she acted with a willful disregard for the safety of others, and that, of course, she was a substantial cause of Helena's death. Not the only cause, we know Alec Baldwin pulled the trigger, but a substantial cause. That is one theory by which the jury could find her guilty of involuntary involuntary manslaughter. The other theory is if the jury says, okay, she loaded the live ammunition into that firearm or she failed to perform an adequate safety check. And that is so important that she should have known the danger of what she was doing. Again, she acted with willful disregard. So even if the jury is undecided as to whether she handed the weapon over directly to Alec Baldwin herself, there's been some debate and conflicting accounts about that. And even if the jury doesn't believe she loaded the live ammunition, but that she failed to do the proper safety check, she could be found guilty. This gives the prosecution a lot of leeway, a lot of room for the jury to convict her. They still have to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. And look, we're going to have a sidebar coming out tonight about the most damning pieces of evidence in this case against her. But on the face of it, look, when a live round is fired from a gun and kills someone on its face, you have to say the armor is the one who's responsible for the guns and the ammunition on set. Unless you can show that there was some sort of sabotage, that someone loaded the gun with a live round when she wasn't looking or that she, you know, after she handed the gun over, it's puts Hannah Gutierrez-Reed in a very, very tough position. It also didn't help that much that the live round didn't appear to come from the ammunition supplier, Seth Kenny. Testimony was suggesting that the live rounds found on that set didn't even look like the live ammunition that he had in his company. And the evidence was that the defendant kept a sloppy prop cart, that there were live rounds on there, that she had taken ammunition from another movie set, left it in her car for two weeks, then brought it onto the Rust set, So it's definitely creating the impression that this, she brought the live ammunition onto the set. Now, prosecutors don't have to prove that, but if the jury believes that she brought the live ammunition on the set, that is really, really bad for her. Now, I would say some of the strongest and most damning evidence against her was from this uh, firearms expert named Brian Carpenter. He was shown all of this footage from the Rust set 
where he sees actors improperly holding the guns, pointing it in the wrong di- direction, including Alec Baldwin. Videos of Gutierrez Reed not holding the gun right herself. And it doesn't stop. And she doesn't stop. She doesn't intervene. She doesn't do what she needs to do. And that's the problem. That's the problem. She is supposed to be the last line of defense. She has to ensure that these things don't happen. It's the prosecution side. Now, the defense will say, well, she was young. She was inexperienced. Female armor. Can she really be expected to stand up to Alec Baldwin, who's rushing this production along? The prosecution would say, yes. Doesn't mean the jury will agree. Jurors are human beings. There's a human aspect to that. There's an empathy element to that. But in terms of strictly the legal professional armor duties, there has been consistent testimony that she should have slowed things down, especially if you see Alec Baldwin wasn't paying attention during the training session sessions. You should have been more careful. Keep a more careful eye on him. And why is all of this important? Because from the accidental discharges to actors pointing weapons at people to the sloppy ammunition all over the place, the prosecution is trying to show that the shooting of Elena Hutchins was foreseeable, that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed should have known what she was doing, and that this could have resulted in a tragic accident like this. Then there's the evidence tampering charge, that she tried to get another crew member to dispose of a bag of cocaine. The idea here was that she knew she was in trouble with the shooting, That there would have been evidence that she had been doing drugs. Investigators coming in. She wanted to get rid of evidence. And that crew member testified to being handed that baggie. Not entirely clear what the baggie was because she got rid of it. Uh, She was a recovering addict herself. Okay, so that's the prosecution. And we'll get to more of your questions in a second. But for the defense, they had a very interesting day yesterday. Because they focused their evidence on an OSHA report that suggested these series of failures was the fault of management, the producers, that Gutierrez Reed couldn't be expected to do what she needed to do. She wasn't given the resources or the time or the opportunity to do what she needed to do because she was working two jobs. She was the armor. She was working for the props. And an OSHA investigator testified that Gutierrez Reed had no authority to make decisions on gun safety training. Now, prosecutors tried to get that OSHA report tossed. They didn't even want the jury to hear about it. it didn't work. And that now conflicts with the prosecution because they have a witness, Gabrielle Pickle, a line producer who said she did give the defendant more armor a day. She was given everything she asked for. Then again, does it take away that maybe she didn't do the proper check on the gun? Did she do the appropriate rattle? She wasn't pulled out of the church to do prop stuff, but armor stuff. And they also called the witness to suggest the defense did that the investigation itself was tainted. You had witnesses who weren't segregated. So were they coordinating their stories? I don't know. Alec Baldwin's phone wasn't taken away immediately. How can we be sure of what exactly happened? And speaking of Baldwin, the defense will say he was an unforeseeable event. He went off script by doing what he did with the gun that day. He chose to fire it. So it can't be that she willfully disregarded the safety when she didn't know about the live round. Fascinating case. Fascinating case here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the law. Uh, a little bit later on. And remember, they could find her guilty of involuntary manslaughter or they could find her guilty of a lesser charge, negligent uh, use of a firearm. And so they have a couple options here. Or they could find her not guilty. Uh, so we're going to take a handful of your questions from the chat. Before we do, I want to run a poll. So if Hannah Gutierrez Reed is found guilty, do you think Alec Baldwin will meet the same fate? Yes, no, not sure. <laughs> Again, in that Alec Baldwin allegedly handled the firearm, but Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is accused of loading the weapon with the live round. I'm interested to hear your opinion. I'm sure he's watching this trial. We know you are, so we'll come back to that poll a little bit later. Let's take some of your questions right now. Uh, Okay, we have a super chat. Uh, It was Hannah's job to keep firearms safe, guilty. So there you have it. Look, I'm of the position, too, and thanks so much for the the, um, the super chat. Um, Here's the thing, the way that I look at it, is you could say someone sabotaged, right? You could say that someone put a live round in there. You could say that, you know, it was she didn't know. But the fact that she was the last line of defense and you had expert testimony saying that you had to slow things down. It was her job. An armor's job is to make sure 
that these accidents don't happen. Why do you do the safety check? To make sure that there's no live rounds in the weapon. That's why. So I, 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 you know, I hear the defense's argument. And it's a good argument, given these facts. But at the same time, I just, I have to agree with you, Sarah. Sarah. I really, uh, I, I could see a conviction here. I really could. All right, we're going to get to more of your uh, super chats uh, in, a, in a second. Actually, let me just give a little highlight. We got some super chats with no question, just people who sent in super chats. Really appreciate it. I'm being haunted, 101. That's so kind of you. I hope that this haunting situation ends. I, I hope it's not too serious. Uh, and we also have Miss Urbex's Ghosts. I don't know if you guys are connected, but hopefully you can communicate. One's being haunted, one's ghost. But thank you so much for the super chat questions. Really appreciate it. Um, all right. I, we have our first guest. We have our first guest with us. We have with us Steve Wolf. Film Industry Armor to talk about this. Uh, Steve, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. I don't appreciate that you have a better background than me, but that's okay. That's totally fine. <laughs> um, no, you, know, you can talk to your scenic design folks and they'll come up with something for you. Oh, we're working on it. We're working on it. Um, yeah. So, Steve, great to have you on. Um, talk to me about what you think so far. We've come to the end of this case. Um, I kind of gave a little bit of my two cents. I really feel that it will be difficult for the defense here, um, given the responsibilities of an armor on this set. Exactly. The armor is the last line of defense and the buck stops there. So, you know, the reason there was live ammo on the set is because of entropy. It's because live ammo exists and stuff gets spread out you know you have to expect that there's going to be live ammo wherever you might be and that's why you know when when you load the gun you know you you start you clear it you make sure there's nothing in there so you're starting blank you actually have to look down each cylinder not make sure there's not residue from something else down there um and then you check each round you take the round and you shake it you listen to it you hear the bb's in there you know it's yeah. not a ground you look for the the holes drilled in the side and then you load them and then you know it's not that hard it's just it's real serious negligence that wasn't done because it's not rocket surgery and and, and look she was on uh interrogation tape saying she checked the dummy rounds most of the time not the best thing to say most of the time i was curious well, I, though. Like saying i break at red lights most of the time I yeah mean. yeah yeah, uh, it's a problem when you're dealing with a case of a live round being put into a movie prop and end up going yeah, off. Right. Um, let me ask you this. There was a big bombshell that happened in this case where Dave Halls, who was the assistant director who pled no contest to a misdemeanor charge of negligently handling the firearm, um, he said that it was Hannah Gutierrez-Reed who actually gave the weapon to Alec Baldwin. We were always under the impression she had handed it over to the AD, to Dave Halls, and then he gave it to Baldwin. Is that the right protocol there? I mean, we're trying to figure out who did what. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, first of all, I wouldn't put much stock in anything Dave Hall said. Uh, going beyond that, though, the armorer handles the gun, checks the gun, loads the gun, gives it to the actor, watches the actor, makes sure the actor doesn't do anything stupid with it, like point it at someone. Uh, and then when they're finished with the rehearsal or the shot, the actor hands the gun back. No, I shouldn't say that. The armorer takes the gun back, re-clears it, and puts it back in safe storage. So nobody should be touching the gun other than the armorer and the actor. Yeah. So if Dave, if Dave in fact, didn't touch the gun, well, you know, good on him. He got something right. Um, we're getting a couple of super chats. I wanted to get your opinion on it. I'll give mine, and then I'll give yours. Um, first of all, we have one from, uh, where is it? Oh, so we have a Marno Frank super chat. Why didn't Hannah testify? Someone died because she didn't do her job and she didn't testify. Now I'm going to couple that with a regular chat that we got from Salt and Peppa. Why didn't she testify? So here's my perspective. Number one, she didn't have to, right? This is not kind of like a self-defense case where someone needs, in a way, needs to take the stand to explain why they took a specific action, why they felt the need to use deadly force. Um, and that's not the only case that people take the stand. Some sort of explanation. But also, she said so much in her police interview that A, she would have to make sure that she was consistent, and B, she would have so much to explain away, she could possibly put herself in a worse position. 
Having said that, Steve, if she did decide to take the stand, um, and you could give your, and I love your opinion about why you think she didn't do it, but if she had taken the stand, would there have been something you'd be looking out for that would have said, hmm, uh, I can see what she's saying there, or that might give you pause? Yeah, if she said, I plead the fifth, I could understand that because I could look up what that amendment is. Um, uh, everything else, you know, wouldn't make sense. So first of all, she doesn't have to take the stand because it's on the state. They have the onus of responsibility to prove their case, not her to defend her case. Uh, so in that regard, you know, there's no reason that she should take the stand. She also probably shouldn't have said anything in those police interviews. And I think, you know, if her lawyer had been doing their job, they just would have kept saying, you don't have to answer that question. And she didn't have to answer any questions. And this really, you know, not that I'm ex excusing anything that, that Hannah did or failed to do, but, you know, you're, once you're a suspect in something, your absolute best policy is shut the f up because <laughs> everything you say is just going to put you in deeper. I agree. I agree. I don't think there would have been much benefit for her to take the stand. I, I say that because... The defense has created a little bit of a of a situation for the jury where they said you not for the, them to find her not guilty because of sympathy, but they wanted people to understand she was an inexperienced young armor who was dealing with an A-list movie star who was bossing people around, was creating a very hectic set, was rushing things. They they say that could she really be expected to just halt the production, to tell Alec Baldwin, wait a minute, I need to be there. You've been on sets before. You know how this works. Is there any credence to that argument that it would have been very, very difficult for Hannah Gutierrez-Reed to jump in and say, listen, we need more safety here. We need to slow things down. How I, I, That argument, I wonder if it could if it'd be compelling. There, there's jurors. some credence to that, and I've seen it happen. And uh, it's on the production company that they hired someone inexperienced. The actual, what do I have to know to make these guns safe is very simple. I mean, I could, I've successfully taught that to six-year-olds and they get it. Um, but more importantly, on set, you have to have presence and you have to have a sense that you have the authority to stop things when they're not going safely. And she didn't feel that she had that by virtue of her age, by virtue of her inexperience, and by virtue of the disparity between her credibility in the industry and Mr. Baldwin's. So mm -hmm. she would feel, I, I believe she would feel going out on a limb if she said, stop, this isn't safe. We're gonna, I, I need to check everything again. Uh, I'm, and I'm gonna hold the production up because of it, which was just the, the consequence. But that is absolutely the job of the armorer. And I'm sure having, you know, grown up with uh, Thel Reed, a very experienced armorer as her dad, she must have seen him do that. But you have to go in there. If you're the armorer, you have to be like the Marines drill sergeant, you know, hand me that gun, point that gun at the ground. We are not moving forward until I render this safe. Anyone who has a problem with that, I'm taking my guns and going home. You find someone else to run your set because I'm not going to be involved in this, these shenanigans because... Mm. Well, you know, what the evidence is when you don't stop because you saw something go wrong, people die. I mean, this is what happened with the space shuttle, right? People knew they didn't say anything. No one wants to stop the launch of the space shuttle. So now you have defective O-rings that lots of people knew about and dead astronauts in a catastrophe. Now we have dead Helena Hutchins because nobody put up their hand and said, can I see that gun? And everyone on the set has the right to stop the production at any time if they feel like there is a safety question. And it doesn't matter, it could be the, you know, the caterer, the wardrobe, right. the hairstylist, anyone who's in that room has a right to say, show me that gun, open the cylinder, show me what's going on in there and shake those rounds for me because I'm in this room and I'm in danger and I have a right to know the condition of that gun. And no one did. And, and that's the, the main theme here. This shouldn't have happened, but there is something, an important element that we're going to get into it. It's actually being addressed by one of our, uh, one of the people who's sending us questions. Again, send your questions in on our live chat. The super chat is the best way to get your message up there. We have a couple of super, super chats I'm going to throw our way, Steve. So first of all, um, this is from TB, TDB. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Is Hannah facing civil lawsuits? P.S. Love the hair. Thank you, Steve. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that... That is just I mean. I, I didn't have to include the second part, Hannah's but I hear. I mean, you know, no, it, it might not have been directed to us. I mean, Hannah's had true. quite a makeover. 
Yeah. You know, that, you know what? You're right. Why am I? I mean, it's all about me all the time. I'm I mean, sorry. You do I'm have sorry. great hair. You know, well, um, thank you. Th- thank nothing you. Nothing away from that. Um, so, yes, she she has been facing uh, litigation. In fact, the latest that I had heard is she had been sued by the gaffer of this uh, of this uh, production, Rust. But there was a talk a few months back, and I forgive me, I don't remember the la- the latest of it, but that she was going to be dropped from that lawsuit for jurisdictional purposes. I believe the person had sued her from California and she didn't have the right amount of contacts or connection to California, which is something you need in a lawsuit. Um, but remember, the the standard of proof is different in a civil case than it is in a criminal case. And we have seen before uh, times where someone could be found not guilty of a crime, but then sued because you're dealing with beyond a reason proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Our highest OJ standard. Simpson, yeah, exactly. OJ Simpson or, or preponderance of the evidence, which is just more likely than not than something happens. So in this case, uh, Steve, it would be much more easy for someone to find her civilly liable for perhaps for negligence than criminally liable for uh for involuntary so, manslaughter so i doubt that i doubt that hannah has the money to hire and uh, hire an attorney hourly which means that any attorney who took the case against her would be taking it on a contingency basis which means they're going to get a third of what you know a, a third of the earnings of someone who's never going to get hired in the film industry again uh, i can't i don't even know how that got filed or why someone would take the case you know other than for the publicity Yep. Yep. It's a good point. Um, all right. We got some more super chats. Carl B. Tell us your hair care routine. That's about me. That one's about me. I'm going to take that one, but I'm not going to answer it now. Um, Carl B. I'll tell you that on the other side. When I have Steve, I have Steve here, but no, I'll, I'll, thank you for the super chat. I'll get to that. Uh, another super chat. K. Cruz, regardless of the script, she still put a live round in the gun. She knew the scope of her position and the consequences of not performing it well. So the, I would answer that, Kay Cruz, and say the jury doesn't have to find definitively that she put the live round in the gun. It could be that she just failed to even check the gun. That could be in and out. It could be that she put the live round in there and she failed to check, or it could be she didn't put the live round in and or, or failed to check. So it, it's that that's the way the prosecution has charged her, and, and it's a very wide way of charging her. So as I mentioned before, the jury has a lot of leeway to find her guilty. Now, your second part, uh, that she knew the consequences of not performing it well. You know what's interesting about that, Steve? is when I was listening to her police interrogation and what she was saying on the body cam, some of the first comments were, I'm a failure, my career is over, I don't want anybody seeing me. She immediately These knew that she could be... These were by the way. Yeah, she knew that she could be... Uh, she was responsible. Right. Well, just and just because you feel guilty about something doesn't mean that you're responsible for it. Um, but, in, but in these cases, I think these were the three most accurate statements that she's made. Uh, in the case. And I think the prosecution is absolutely right. You're you're guilty if you put live ammo in there and you're guilty if you failed to check that there was live ammo in there. So that's that's a damned if you do situation right there. Yep, that's a that's a good point. Um, so let me move but the on. presumption is that there's ammo. There's pr- the presumption is that there is live ammo in every gun. And that's why the first rule of gun, gun safety you know, some people say, you know, assume all guns are. All, it's not assume. This is life and death. And so, you know, we're we're not in the realm of make believe. So when I state the first rule of gun safety, I say all guns are always loaded, and that is a fact until proven otherwise. Mm-hmm. And that, mm-hmm. therefore, every time a gun is handled by anyone who touches it, it is their responsibility to ascertain the condition of that firearm. We got Whether more questions. Live ammo, no ammo, dummy round, blank, whatever. The gun's in your hand. It's your responsibility to know the condition of the gun. That's exact. That's where I stand. That's where I stand. I, I mean, again, if I, if unless they presented evidence that she checked the gun, handed it over, and someone secretly put in ammunition or tampered with the gun in some way, I, I, I just feel since she was the last line of defense, and that's why you have an armor. But I do have some specific questions for you, Steve. Um, so we have one, a super chat, another super chat. Thank you so much. From Awakened Warrior, a new armorer should be required to have years on set with a professional armorer before they could be qualified to take on that role on their own. What's your thought? Uh, Disagree. Uh, Recommended. Good practice. Mentorship is absolutely the way to learn. But what 
they actually have to learn to do physically is simply to you know open the cylinder or check a magazine or uh, check the chamber uh, make sure that there's nothing in there and then if they do put something in there it has to come from this box it has to look like this it has to sound like this and it doesn't take years of experience to know how to do that so the the standard of what you have to do physically and mentally to do your job properly is very very simple and the reason for wanting to have a lot of experience is it yeah, at it is to have the presence the physical and commanding presence that people respect you and listen to you because what you say is the law that if someone violates the safety protocols that you set up you pack those guns up and you get off set well, and that's and, it. and, and i think and i think there was ample evidence to suggest that Alec Baldwin did not respect Hannah Gutierrez read. I mean, there was a on the tape one of the foot pieces of footage from Rust. He, he's he's instructed her on how to do her job because she didn't have another re gun ready to go. Now, I will tell you, I, I imagined Awakened Warrior has asked this question because it seemed to me the evidence would suggest production was cutting cost and they wanted to find a cheap armor that they could then throw the prop duties on her as well. So I think that was the concern having this inexperienced armor on set, probably co cutting costs, but also throw more duties at her that probably weren't the best thing. Um, and that doesn't take right. away from what she re could be responsible for. But I think that's the problem, too, is the fact that she was hired in the first place. That's right. She didn't have the experience. She had one movie under her belt. She'd received safety violation complaints on that film. And so, therefore, she, she would be the least expensive option. And that's really not, you know, you, you don't want to go into battle with equipment made by the, the low bidder and the, yep. the same thing on the, on the movie set. Now, if you want to hire a, an experienced caterer or an experienced hairstylist, you know, it, maybe you wouldn't personally like that. But, uh, you know, the consequences of that are, are minor. But yep. the, the armorer, you know, that's a position where if they don't do their job right, it's pretty obvious someone's going to die. So that's not the place to skimp. Now, again, I'm, I actually answered a question. This was from Marno Frank, a super chat. Thank you so much, Marno, for this additional super chat. Do you think the low budget that the film had played a role? A low budget film doesn't mean you don't be professional. So good question. I think we answered that. We True. have another question that I wanted to ask you. This is from Chris, another super chat. Uh, live reloaded rounds are made with unique components. Why not ID the origin of the live ammo and who reloaded them? It doesn't seem very difficult. Now, before I give you the, the mic here, Steve, about that, it's a great question because we were trying to figure out where the live ammunition came from. And there was testimony and evidence to suggest that it did not come from Seth Kenny and PDQ because the live ammo that was recovered on the set, and there were six rounds that were recovered, did not match the live ammo that the company had. So what's your take on um, Chris's Super Chat question? That it's a curiosity, but irrelevant to the case. Sure, if you want to know where the ammo came from, you can, you know, go hunt down that trail. But it doesn't matter. The fact is that the issue that are germane to this case are that someone put it into the gun without checking right. and that, you know, no one checked what was in there. So yep. the, the prosecution is absolutely right on this case. Uh, you know, why did you put live ammo in a gun? Why didn't you check that there was not, you know, the what should have been in there? uh failure to check that there was live ammo so those yep. are the really the two relevant things i don't you know i don't really care who manufactured the powder and who you know put the primer in who seated the round i mean well well, okay. well the if defense wanna, would be the, tool, yeah you know. but the the defense is suggesting since we don't have answers to this question since we didn't it wasn't thoroughly vetted about whether there was some sort of sabotage the prosecution cannot prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. They're saying the jury needs all the answers. And I, I, that's a fair argument. But like you and I both yeah. discussed, even if there was sabotage, even if someone put those live rounds in, if she checked it before handing it off to Baldwin, that feels to me kind of like the slam dunk of this case. Steve Wolf? Exactly. Yeah, and, and someone absolutely, you know, they could have said, uh, you know, Hannah, could you bring some live ammo? Because, you know, yeah. on break, the stunt guys want to go out and shoot some tin cans or whatever. Fine. Yeah. You know, uh, live ammo could have got left in there that way as well. So yeah. it doesn't right. matter though. If you clear the gun before you hand it to somebody, no death. Steve Wolf, really appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much for being so generous with your time and expertise. I know you've been on the network as well. Uh, really appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.
All right, everybody. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to continue on taking your questions. Let me just, uh, Steve was great. Uh, I'm just now going to answer this question. This is from Carl B. Tell us your hair care routine. I didn't think it was appropriate to have that conversation yet. I'll have it now. Um, real quick, this is a secret, but you, you, you sent in a super chat, so I'll have to tell you. It's a combination of blow drying. It's a combination of using a hat. And it's a combination of using forming cream, not gel, forming cream. Years in the making. It took a lot of practice. A good super chat, nonetheless. All right. Before we get to more of your questions, I have the results of the poll as of right now. Remember the poll? If Hannah Gutierrez Reed is found guilty, do you think Alec Baldwin will meet the same fate? Well, it looks like, wow, 58% of you say yes, 26% of you say no, and 15% of you say you're not sure. Really, really interesting there. Um, I, I, you know what? I'm going to actually ask my next guest about that. Now, remember, um, this is kind of two different levels of responsibility. They both could be held criminally responsible. One loaded the gun or allegedly loaded the gun. One allegedly fired the gun. And you could have two causes for the same event. Um, so it's a really interesting question. Keep that coming in. Uh, again, send your chats into the live chat. Send your questions into the live chat. But if you want your message up at the front, we'll read it right th here and now. Super chat, the best way to get your message to the top. All right. Uh, I want to bring in my next guest. We have with us Natalie Whittingham Burrell, criminal defense attorney, YouTuber. Natalie, thanks so much for coming on. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So let me just pause. Let me throw that question to you. If Hannah Gutierrez Reed is found guilty, does how does this affect Alec Baldwin's case? Because I will tell you, and as I mentioned, there was a lot that came out in this trial so far against him. A lot about the weapon, a lot about his behavior. What's your take? Yeah. So my take is that from a defense standpoint, which is the type of attorney I am, I'm a criminal defense attorney, um, Alec Baldwin's attorneys are going to throw everything on Hannah Gutierrez. They're going to basically, if she's found guilty. So she'll become the scapegoat for the defense team. And I think that that could in some way benefit uh, the defense. But also he does have a level of involvement that if they can prove the case against her beyond a reasonable doubt, the prosecution might feel stronger that they can prove the case against Alec Baldwin. So I think it's just, it's a matter of how much confidence it gives each side, right? Because he'll get his own separate trial with his own separate evidence. But I am pretty sure the defense strategy will be to put everything on Hannah Gutierrez, especially if she's found guilty. See, the problem with him is that he was really rushing the production and he was at one point telling Anna Gutierrez Reed had to do her job, which I can imagine a prosecutor saying, You felt so confident, felt so confident on how to tell the job. He knows how this works. He knows how these sets work. He knows how these firework these firearms work. And the fact that he had previously said he didn't pull the trigger, which again is a problem because of the yeah. ballistics evidence that came out, um, which we'll talk about. But we have some super chats here that I want to get to. So this is from Johnny's girl. Thank you so much for sending the super chat. Uh, she should be the she should not be the only one charged. Sarah, meaning Sarah Zachary, is just as guilty. Throwing away rounds is tampering with evidence. Alec is also guilty. Your thoughts, Natalie? Yeah, I think throwing away rounds is really problematic. I mean, I just, I don't see any other way to really look at that. And I throw it back to what you said originally, Jesse, which is um, his initial story that he didn't pull the trigger is laughable. You know, um, anything that knows anything about modern day guns knows that that doesn't happen anymore. You pull the trigger, you have to pull the trigger. And so that's why every single time you carry a gun, you have to act as though it is deadly and dangerous and take all the necessary steps to make sure that it's safe. And so I think that there were enough things that came out about Alec Baldwin here that would seriously uh, hurt his case. Um, and that really his, his attorney's uh, real hope would be to to take all the responsibility from him and put it on someone else. We have a great uh, super chat question about this. This is IR Geek. Um, thank you so much for the super chat. The state's expert armor witness said that actors aren't expected to check, but at least three others were. So how could Baldwin be responsible? Now, I don't remember exactly the three others that testified to that, but I would say as the producer of the film, 
And as somebody who was supposed to get the proper training, but allegedly wasn't paying attention, and one of the lead actors who was handling weapons on a fair basis, that's what sets him apart. Would you agree? Yes. So the level of responsibility is not the responsibility of an actor on set. Um, The level of responsibility comes from his role as a producer. And I know that we've heard from uh, one of the attorneys of one of the other gentlemen involved that's already pled in the case uh, that said that basically he wasn't in charge of the guns and he was only David Halls. David Halls. Yes. For the money side. I just I don't think that that's right. I think that it's clear that he had more of a level of involvement as a producer, and that's going to give him a certain level of responsibility than, say, an extra on the set that was just handling a gun. We have another question that I wanted to get to. Uh, This is from, where is it? Uh, Words789. Will the OSHA findings hold much weight on jury deliberations? Now, we obviously don't know. But what I would say is I think that was such an important piece of evidence for the defense. We know the prosecution didn't want it in. When you have an OSHA report, and yes, they're an independent agency, different. They're looking at something different than what prosecutors are looking at. But the fact that they came forward and basically said that it was the management who had all these these, uh, series of failures that they didn't address that resulted in the shooting. And you're putting the blame on them. And saying that they didn't give Hannah Gutierrez Reed the adequate time to do what she needed to do. That's compelling, if not inconsistent, with testimony that we heard that Hannah Gutierrez Reed was given extra armor days. And on the day in question, she left the church to do not other duties, not prop duties, but armor duties. So she could have stayed in the church. How quickly, how much more would have taken her to check the cylinder? Because allegedly she didn't check the cylinder properly before giving the gun over to Alec Baldwin or Dave Halls, depending upon who you believe. But it seems to me that the OSHA findings could be something that the jury wrestles with, no? I really don't think so, because um, Ms. Gutierrez, the duty that she did have and what she had control over did not seem to be following through on her duties in the negligence. And so um, she had a duty and responsibility as an armorer. And the facts to me did not bear out that she was prevented from following through with her duties. Other failures definitely happened along the way. And those other people are accountable, but she was one of the cogs in the machine that failed and she had a responsibility not to fail. That's how I would look at that. Um, Now, if the facts had borne out that she did everything that she could do, but she was actually prevented prevented from doing those things, then I would feel differently. I just don't think that that's how it, the, that might be their argument, but that's not how the facts were presented to the jury. So a uh, great super chat question right here from very original, very original 78. And this is a very original question from very original 78. And thank you for the super chat. Does Jesse have any advice for attorneys slash future attorneys about things to do slash keep in mind when handling a case like this. Now, I'm going to go to you too, Natalie, on this. I I will say, first of all, we should keep in mind that Carrie Morrissey, who is the prosecutor in this case, is not a prosecutor by trade. She is a defense attorney that was brought on as a special prosecutor. And there has been a lot of debate. And I will tell you this. One of the things I don't love to see is the back and forth between the attorneys that seems to me to be unprofessional at times. And, mm-hmm. and I'm reminded that you have two defense attorneys against each other, right? And so you kind of see that battle of back and forth. And, and you don't want to see it. The jury shouldn't have to see it. Uh, but it's gotten nasty at times. And she's provided a lot of speaking objections that have gone on for quite some time. Um, not to criticize her, because I actually think that she and her team have put on a terrific case. If you're going to charge somebody with involuntary manslaughter for these set of facts, I think the evidence has been incredibly compelling in terms of the defense. Look, I, I think they have some difficult facts to contend with. Um, are they throwing a lot at the wall to see what sticks, saying, you know, it was Seth Kenny, uh, it was Gab- it was this person, it was uh, sabotage, it was, uh, you know, the, the OSHA report says that the managers the, and the producers were at fault, not her. Um, their job is to raise reasonable doubt and raise questions, and, and I think that's what they're trying to do. They've been given a really bad set of facts here, um, but Natalie, I will ask you, it, I don't particularly see anything that they should do differently in terms of presenting their cases? Not sure if you feel differently. 
Um, I would say that, you know, when you talk about the um, tussling back and forth that's occurring in front of the jury, I really try to avoid that in my own trials. And the reason being is this. Um, when you're at the bench, uh, in a bench conference with the husher on where the jury can't hear you, the rest of the court can't hear you, you can get a bit more spicy, but you don't know how the jury is perceiving. For me, it's the prosecutor who's the other side. For me, you don't know how they're perceiving that person. And so you, they might really like them or something or identify with them. They might look like their daughter or, or niece or nephew. And here you are kind of going back and forth with them. So I try to quell that as much as possible. It's I think it's important to remain um uh, it's an adversarial system, but you do not have to be nasty and disagreeable in order to advocate for your client very zealously. And I think yep. sometimes Remember that you really do catch more bees with honey than with vinegar. When making very stringent arguments, doing so with a smile and catching people off guard by being nice while you're being nasty is very effective. So that's one of the <laughs> biggest. I always tell the, the young students that I deal with in my profession um, about that, you know, kill them with kindness. It really does help. All right. Some great legal advice from Natalie Whittingham Burrell. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate you. you taking the time. Love talking to you, Natalie. We've got to get you on more. Thanks. Thank you, Jesse. Oh, can I just say one thing before I go? I don't want to kill your Absolutely. Schedule. Absolutely. Okay. I saw someone in the comments say, is that Natalie Lawyer Chick? So yes, that is Natalie Lawyer Chick. I'm here on YouTube. Sorry. Okay, bye. Is that, is that your, yeah, yeah. Promote. Is that, yeah. is that your, uh, is that your handle? Is that your YouTube yeah. site? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's and I never say that on here. So yes, one of my uh, subscribers is in the comment section and says I need to awesome. say my name. So I'm there you go, that. love it, Thanks, love it. Uh, all, right, all right, famous Natalie. Thank all you right. so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. All right, so we're gonna take more of your questions, more of your comments. Throw them up in the live chat again. Super chat. The best way to get those questions up to the top. We'll make sure to answer them. We're gonna get back to that poll in a little bit. Uh, one question we have: a, a super chat from Alano. <laughs> I would, <laughs> I would love to sniff your hair. Is it minty or more of a musk? This is a family show. This is a family show, Alano. I appreciate the question. Minty. Okay, let's, uh, before we go forward, uh, I want to just take a minute here. I want to take a minute, get serious, to thank our incredible partner and sponsor, Morgan & Morgan, that makes so much of this happen for us. Look, when we're dealing with the Rust case, what does that show? It shows that these tragic, unfortunate events, they can happen when you least expect it. And that includes when you get injured. It is so important to know what your rights are if you're ever seriously hurt and whether your injury could be worth millions of dollars. That is why Morgan & Morgan, who I want to talk about right now, the largest injury law firm in the country, that's where they come in. So they will fight for the compensation you deserve. And you know why they're so big? You know why? Because they win a lot. They recently won verdicts of $6.8 million in New York, $12 million in Florida, and $26 million in Philadelphia. You see, Morgan & Morgan, they don't settle for these lowball offers from insurance companies. And here, these verdicts, they were all considerably higher than the highest insurance offers for these accidents. Fighting big companies, it takes a big firm. Now, what makes Morgan & Morgan also very special is not just how big they are, it's how easy they make it for their clients. They've completely modernized the process. You submit your claim, you talk to your whole legal team, all from your smartphone. You can see if you have a case in only a few minutes. And get this, the fee absolutely free unless you win. So to start your claim now with Morgan & Morgan, go to forthepeople.com slash LC Sidebar, or I believe you can click the link if we have it up or it's pinned in the comments. Hopefully it is, but check out Morgan & Morgan. Again, we very much appreciate their support. All right, we got another super chat, and then I'm going to bring in my next guest, Ava Smith. Oh, just Ava Smith being so kind with a super donation, super chat. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the support. Uh, we have another question. What is your over-under prediction regarding the length of deliberations? It's like asking me what the lottery numbers are going to be. It's impossible to know. Um, but I will take a guess. I don't think they're coming back in the next 10 minutes. I don't think they're coming back today. This is a complicated case. This is a complicated case. I would not be surprised if they come back tomorrow. They're going to be deliberating. I think they'll be able to deliberate for several hours today. Some difficult questions. And remember, something to let everybody know that we haven't talked about yet is the jury has to find unanimously 
if they want to vote in favor of involuntary in man manslaughter, they have to be unanimous. That's clear, right? And remember, I said there were two alternative theories by which they could find um, Hannah Gutierrez Reed guilty of involuntary manslaughter. If they do not reach a unanimous verdict on involuntary manslaughter, that's it. They don't move on to the other question. If they are unanimous on the that, that not guilty for you, involuntary manslaughter, only then can they decide whether or not she is guilty of a lesser charge of negligent use of a firearm. And of course, they have to find her, uh, una has, the verdict has to be unanimous there. That is a lesser charge. My understanding is a misdemeanor. But um, a negligent use of a deadly weapon or firearm consists of endangering the safety of another by handling or using a firearm or other, other deadly weapon in a negligent manner. And the reason I say that is I was actually listening to the jury instructions today, thinking about the case and saying, I wonder if the jury is going to say she needs to be held criminally responsible. We just don't believe it rises to the level of manslaughter. Perhaps they would find her guilty of that. We shall wait and see. All right. So as we get more of your super chat questions in and more of your chat questions and questions in, let me bring in my next guest. We're joined by Lisa Taraco, criminal defense attorney. So good to have you here, Lisa. Really, really appreciate it. Um, by the way, first of all, I haven't seen you in a while. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Excellent. Perfect. Not bad, thank right? You. Not bad. After yeah, not very doing good. It. Um, and I like your hair. You look good. Well, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> So, so talk to me about um, what you think has been the most compelling evidence on the part of the prosecution in this case, and the most compelling evidence you think on the defense's side. Um, well, as you know, um, I'm Dave Hall's lawyer. And so I'm going to start with Mr. Hall's because I thought he gave, contrary to other people's opinions, I thought he gave amazing testimony. And I thought he helped both the defense and the prosecution. I felt like he had the least motive to lie because they've, we've already litigated his case. He came in very early on, wanted to take responsibility and pled guilty to the misdemeanor. So I feel like he had no motive to lie. He's not suing anyone, he's being sued. Um, but he has no money, so it's not like they're going to, you know, collect a whole lot. So I felt like he testified with a lot of integrity. He made a comment at the end of his testimony that surprised me. But he said, look, I, I want to come to tell the truth because there's all these other stories out there. And, you know, I, I want people to know what really happened. And I want changes in the industry. And I thought it was very heartfelt. And I thought that I thought that gave him credibility, and um, so he he testified that he did not give the gun to Baldwin. Yeah, can we, can we can we highlight that yeah. for a second because that was a big surprise to a lot of people. We had always been under the impression that the chain of command, the chain of custody, was Hannah Gutierrez Reed had handed the weapon to your client, Dave Halls. He gave the weapon to Alec Baldwin. Now, again, Alec Baldwin had previously said, uh, yes, uh, for he first, I believe he had first said that it was um, uh, Hannah Gutierrez. He first said that Dave Halls had handed him the weapon. Then he changed it and said it was Hannah Gutierrez Reed who gave him the weapon. Hannah Gutierrez Reed has always said that uh, uh, Dave Halls gave uh, Alec Baldwin the weapon. But th that was a big surprise to a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened when, was when the, when the case first came out, like the very first day, um, one of the witnesses called the police and called 911. And that witness said, you know, Dave Halls grabbed the gun from the prop cart. And from that moment on, it was just this um, snowball effect. So every media outlet in the beginning covered that. And, and Dave Halls is going, no, that's not what happened. And I think it was really important to him to, to testify to his truth. This is what happened. And Dave also doesn't like guns, so he, why would he ever take the gun from the armorer? He doesn't hold guns. You know, he's not, he's not a gun owner. So I thought that was important. And I, I understand that, you know, other people disagree, but I absolutely believed him that he did, that Hannah, why would he take the gun? Why would she give Dave Halls the gun? It goes armor to actor. See, see, that was very interesting to me. And I'm going to get to a super chat in a, in a minute. But Lisa, when I was thinking about that, 
I think it was very interesting that the jury knows he took a he he pled guilty or pled no contest. And, and, and I think that they realize if he had some level of responsibility and he wasn't the one who loaded the gun and he wasn't even the one who handed the gun, then how could they find Hannah Gutierrez Reed not guilty? And, and that's the way that I took it. And, and I know you're, you're limited in what you can say um, about what the, this case, what you think will actually happen. But the fact that the jury has heard about your client and heard about his legal situation. I'm curious what effect you think that might have. Yeah, I was surprised that they allowed that to come into evidence, quite honestly, because I can also see the jury going, well, and and remember, Dave took the stand and said, I was negligent. I did not check that gun well enough. And, you know, through tears and, you know, I know that he has felt responsible ever since, you know, that, that instance, I failed, I failed. So maybe they just find Hannah guilty of the same crime as Dave. I'm just throwing this out. This sure, isn't sure, necessarily sure. what I think, but that would have been my concern if I was the prosecution, if they find out that Dave um, was found or Dave admitted no contest to the negligent use of weapon, maybe that's all they'll hold Hannah responsible for. Because that, that's, that's what a I lesser said before. Included. Yes, that's what I was yeah. thinking before. It's a possibility that, um, but again, her role, very different than Mr. Hall's. I, I do want to ask you, Lisa, we have, um, we have a super chat. We got a super chat from Canned Can Opener. Are these not the best names that you've ever heard? I know, I love it. Canned yeah. Can Opener, thank you so much for the super chat. Since this got a bit of attention in the trial, what are your thoughts on expert witnesses? Should they be more officially slash formally vetted instead of just explaining to the court in the moment? Well, I would say, and and Lisa, I'm obviously going to throw this to you. Look, the prosecution chooses who they want as their expert. The defense chooses who they want as their expert. They look at their qualifications. It's important for the jury in the first few minutes to understand the qualifications of that person. So it adds a sense of legitimacy and authenticity to what they're saying. Um, No witness is perfect, even the most the, the, the most premier experts in the field will face tough qual- questions about their qualifications and their findings. But I'll throw it back to you. Well, I'm wondering, is Can Can referring to when the defense expert pointed the gun at the judge? Uh, so a- so, so I, will t- I will throw that in with another question, because how damaging was the gun expert to the trial? This was the defense's expert who was accused of pointing the fake gun at the judge. Yeah, I... Uh, I don't have a great explanation for that. It made a lot of headlines. Throw it back to you, Lisa. Well, I'm wondering, I mean, and it'll be interesting because we get to talk to the jury afterwards if they'll talk to us, but it really goes to show how accidents happen. You know? Yeah, accidents. not great in a case where your client has been accused of not policing people who were pointing weapons on the set at other people. It's something that, not the best, to say the least. Um, let me ask you this. So, so just generally speaking, going back to can, can opener, do you think that there should be some more formal or official vetting process of these witnesses bef- before they go to court instead of just laying out their qualifications? Well, two things. Um, the attorneys decide who they want, of, of course, with approval of the client. But the attorney will say, I need Bert, let's use them. So hopefully the attorney has done that. If the other side thinks that the opposing counsel is bringing in a person who's not really an expert, kind of like a fake expert or a charlatan, then the attorneys can challenge the other side's experts in motions prior to trial. So we would hope that that sort of vetting has already taken place. Mm. So let me, let me ask you this. Uh, First of all, we got another super chat. This is from Ann Elizabeth. This is the best place to watch live trials. Ann, I love you. I love you. Don't tell my wife, but I love you. Different kind of love, but I love you. Um, Let me ask you this, Lisa. So there was talk towards the end of this case. The defense brought in an expert. I believe it was a private investigator who who said he was bothered by the fact that witnesses weren't segregated. Um, And the problem with that is when you don't segregate witnesses, do they start getting their stories together? Do they start coordinating what happened? And and even if it's not uh, nefarious, it could be a problem in terms of your memory, right? You might remember one thing, somebody else said. There was a conversation about Alec Baldwin talking to your client, Dave Halls, after the shooting. What, what should people be thinking about in terms of that? What do you think the jury might be thinking about in terms of that? 
I don't know if we really um, cared about that in this trial, because again, I think that Dave was kind of the only one that didn't have a motive to, to twist the truth in his favor. We might see that if the Baldwin case goes to trial. I don't know about those conversations. It, it is always concerning when the police do not separate people. And the other thing is it's always concerning when someone who is suspected of a crime gets to make phone calls because those phone calls can be to anyone who tells people to say this or you know don't admit to this or whatever and you really don't get that kind of candid right after the incident that that really candid um conversation about what happened and it, it does get tainted and that's why we want the police to do that so it was concerning but, Lisa, i don't know if you, it affected it let me ask you about alec baldwin because obviously he has to be watching this trial uh, and the impact of this trial, uh, what, what the outcome of it is going to have an effect on his case. Um, I, I'm going to do uh, a sidebar, which is our podcast. I'm going to do a sidebar. My plan is to do one on some of the most, um, you know, some of the evidence that came out during the course of this trial um, that kind of implicates Alec Baldwin. Um, and I'm curious if there was something that came out here that you think is going to affect his case. Um, you mentioned, because you said something, interesting, if it goes to trial, and I didn't know, you know, obviously the charges could be dropped. That's happened before. The charges were dropped. They were refiled. Could also could take uh, some sort of deal. This trial effect on Alec Baldwin, what's your take? Um, well, I said that because at one of the prior hearings on the Baldwin case, the defense attorney raised the fact that they have dispositive motions that they want to be filing. And he said, we have motions that things were not handled correctly. I think he was implying to in the grand jury, the, the second, the indictment. Um, and so the confidence of which that attorney put forth that, you know, they're going to win this case on a motion is why I'm saying if it does go to trial. But then I forgot your question. My question is, there's different levels of potential culpability here, right? You know, she allegedly loaded the weapon, didn't check it. He was the one who allegedly fired it. He he really got himself into hot water by saying he didn't pull the trigger. Ballistics forensic testing would suggest that that under these circumstances, that is very unlikely, almost impossible to happen. You have to pull the trigger in order to for that gun to be discharged. Um, and we learned, we saw a lot of video of him on the set, the way he was handling the gun the way he was allegedly rushing the production. We heard about ballistics evidence. Carrie Morrissey in her closing argument today even referenced Alec Baldwin, say he's going to have to answer one day for what he did. And, and I'm just curious, you know, this trial, after everything we've seen, do you think it helps his case in any way or hurts his case in any way? I think if um, Hannah is convicted, I think it's possible the prosecution can say, okay, we had a, a death and we've held someone accountable. And it might take some of the heat off of the Baldwin trial. But I also know that there's a real split in the community here in Santa Fe, because some people think, because it's a big film community, and some people think the actor relies on the armor and the assistant director. And when the actor is handed a prop, that actor trusts that. And so therefore Baldwin did not do wrong. It was just a tragic accident. So, so there's a real split in how people see, it's not like it was a hunting incident and they handed him the gun, you know, or on the streets and your homie hands you a gun as you're driving by, you know, the enemy. This is right. a very different setting. So we'll see as it plays out. It's so interesting. Um, all right, so we're going to take another round of super chat questions, regular chat questions. This is the time to get it in. If you have a question for me or Lisa before we sign off, Got another super chat question. This is from Fly205 Productions. Do you think that the incident with the defense witness accidentally pointing the gun to the judge slash prosecutor could negatively impact Hannah Gutierrez Reed? It's such a good question because the last time I remember this happening was the Alec Murdoch trial where the defense attorney was holding the weapon. Let me rephrase. There was no murder weapon that was recovered in that case. There was a weapon that he was holding that could have been it. And he pointed at the prosecution's table and, and joked, tempting. People laughed. There was a little bit of dark humor. But, but, but this, is, this is a case where it's all about how you pointed the weapon, right? It's all about don't point it at people. And, and the fact that their witness allegedly did the one thing that she's accused of not policing 
I would say it does hurt her case. Well, it seems if it was Baldwin's case, it would have really helped because it shows how accidents happen. But Gutierrez's case is more about, I think, narrowly focusing on, did she load the, the live uh, ammo and did she fail to check it? I would see, so see, I, I would, see, I would disagree because I think the okay. most that they've shown about that people on the set, there was accidental discharges, the, the ammunition was all over the place, that people were pointing the guns in the wrong directions. It goes to that foreseeability argument. She knew all this was going on. It should have been foreseeable to her that something like this could have happened. That's where I think it really it matters. And, and let me give you just another slight perspective. The sure. whole time I've done this case, it's like when you check the, the firearm, you never check it for live ammo because live ammo is never on a film set. So it's like you're checking it to see if she loaded dummies or blanks. The thought that that you're ever checking it for live ammo was unfathomable. And you got that from Joel Souza as well as Dave Hall's. So it's kind of like, you know, it wasn't ever foreseeable. Remember, uh, Joel Souza said, after I got shot, I kept thinking, what happened? How, how could this have been? The thought that well, it was live ammo. I like this back and forth because I will counter that and say okay. there were live rounds found on her prop cart. So she should have been checking that there were live rounds there. And, and with all the problems, accidental discharges, is it outside the realm of possibility to say, i got to check this for uh, live rounds. Joel Souza might not know. He's not so involved in the day-to-day -day of the ammunition. and So, of course, he would be surprised. But the fact that there were live rounds found on her prop cart, I think that added an extra level of awareness for her. I, I hear what you're saying. But I also think that Joel Souza didn't know there were live ammo. Like you said, Dave Halls didn't know there was live ammo. The, the, the camera crew, the, the lighting, all those people didn't know there was live ammo. Did Hannah know there was live ammo? I mean, I don't know if we ever really got that. Yeah, well, or was again, she and, just and, reckless in not verifying that it was live ammo? And as we've talked about, the jury could find her guilty of involuntary manslaughter if they say she negligently used the weapon or she uh, loaded the weapon with live ammunition or she just failed to check it. So there's all these different ways. Mm -hmm. um, we got another. We got a great super chat. Some would say <laughs> my favorite super chat. This is from Haley Weber. Jesse, you are doing a great job. Love your wife. So that is probably my favorite super chat I've gotten of the day. No offense to the others, but it is my wife. That's very sweet of her. Um, so, so talk to me about this case in terms of the involuntary manslaughter charge in the past several years. And I, I love you too, Haley, by the way. But in this, in the last, in the last several years, involuntary manslaughter has been used in these kind of unique ways. I think about the Michelle Carter case where a woman uh, was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter for pressuring her boyfriend over the phone to kill himself. OK, mm -hmm. um, she wasn't even in the same room with him. It was all over the phone. It was through text messages. We saw recently the James Crumbly case, a mother being found guilty of involuntary manslaughter for not doing enough to prevent her son from uh, committing a mass shooting. Now, involuntary manslaughter being used here against an armorer for a, uh, a set shooting, an accidental shooting. Talk to me about how we're stretching this and, and whether it makes sense. I don't think the Hannah Gutierrez charging of, in, of uh, the manslaughter charge, I don't think that's a stretch. I mean, I think, yep. you know, the question is, is the armor ultimately responsible or not? You know, we're talking about a firearm. To me, this, the stretch would be many years ago and, I, unlike you, I, I can't cite the name of the cases, but there was a series of cases in New York City of contractors who built buildings and, and kind of, you know, cut corners. And then, you know, the building collapses and people die charged with charged with voluntary manslaughter. So, you know, to me, those things are stretches. But I don't know that this particular case, when we're talking about a firearm, we're talking about ammo, you know, we're talking about someone pointing the gun at another human, you know, all of those things. I think those do lend themselves and beg the question. And that's the jury question. You know, was it negligent use? Was it a manslaughter or was it just an accident and we walk away? Uh, we have another super chat. This is from TDB. So sorry, Haley. Jesse and his hair are mine. Uh oh, I don't, I don't like fighting. I don't like fighting on here. No. Um, let me ask you about the defense. 
Yeah. So the defense raised a lot of different things here, right? They said that the OSHA report would indicate that the fault doesn't lie with Hannah Gutierrez Reed as much as it does with the managers and the the managerial team, the producers. They faulted the investigation. They said that she was spread too thin. She had two different jobs. She wasn't able to do the what was necessary. The counter argument to that is there is evidence to say she was granted extra armor days. How long would it have taken her to just do a quick cylinder check of all the ammunition to do a quick rattle? Um, do you think the defense put on a good case? Was there something that you said, I would have expected them to do something differently? Um, well, you're talking about my colleagues. You know, I, I've known Jason Bowles and Carrie Morrissey for decades, so yes. <laughs> it would be really tough for me to tell you that someone did an inferior job. I would like Which is, to by the way, let me, let me, I don't believe. I don't believe at all. I actually think they both did terrific jobs, given the facts and circumstances of this case, particularly Carrie Morrissey, who was put in as the special prosecutor in this case, coming from a defense attorney. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's go with that. Um, I do. I do want to say that I think the best lawyer out of the team was probably the attorney for Dave Halls, wow. who handled it, I, got it. I know you. <laughs> you, you have no bias in that whatsoever. But yeah, none at all. Um, but the OSHA report. You know, that's kind of int- going back to the merits. The OSHA report. That's really interesting because, of course, OSHA found management and producers responsible because that's the OSHA inquiry. That's what OSHA does. They decide if the job in total, the entire safety of, of, of a workplace is safe. So there's no way that they're going to hold any one individual responsible. They just determine that's their inquiry. It was the workplace safe or was it not? So I was surprised that that came in. Um, I do think that there's the issue of it was a messy workplace and Hannah, Ms. Reed, Ms. Gutierrez Reed was kind of running all over the place. I do see that cuts both ways because that almost um, supports the prosecution's case that she was above careless. She she couldn't manage at all. And that's not anyone's fault but hers for taking the position. And I also see that the defense side is that, look, she couldn't have possibly managed it, almost conceding the recklessness. I was kind of really, I would go back and forth on, on that defense. Right, right. All right. Well, does at that least to, that does make sense. And I, listen, I think you, uh, I think you nailed it very well. Very, very political. Very good. No, but I think you, I, look, I actually think they're both doing terrific jobs. I would like to see a I little agree. less fighting between them, but hey, what are you going to do? But Lisa Taraco, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate it too. Such a yeah, pleasure. Such a pleasure. Um, Tell Haley right. I said Oh, I will. I will. I will. So listen, here's what we're going to do. Um, if you have any last, uh, we like Lisa's hair too. Oh, she signed off, but that was a freebie question. All right. We like Lisa's hair too. Um, so listen, I, again, I just want to thank, uh, our incredible partner and sponsor one more time, Morgan and Morgan for helping make these kinds of shows happen. As I said, with this rust case, especially when you're dealing with tragic, unfortunate events that happen when you least expect it, Getting injured is one of those times, and it is so important to know what your rights are if you're ever seriously hurt, and whether your injury could be worth millions of dollars. That's why I talk about Morgan & Morgan, the largest injury law firm in the country, because they fight for the compensation you deserve. And you know why they're so big? Because they win a lot. I'm talking verdicts recently. Verdicts. $6.8 million in New York, $12 million Florida, $26 million in Philadelphia. I mean, Morgan & Morgan they don't settle for lowball offers from insurance company and these companies and these verdicts, they are considerably higher than the highest insurance offers for these accidents. Fighting big companies takes a big firm. And what makes Morgan & Morgan very special is not just how big they are, but I always talk about it, how easy they make it for their clients. They've completely modernized the process because you submit your claim, you talk to your legal team, all from your smartphone. You can see if you have a case in just a few minutes. And the fee is absolutely free unless you win. So to start your claim now with Morgan & Morgan, go to ForThePeople.com slash LC Sidebar. Hopefully we have it up in the uh, link, in the description, pinned in the comments. But uh, listen, everybody. Uh, oh, we got one more. We got one more. Got one more uh, question from Canned Can Canned Can Opener. Thank you so much. Thank you for complimenting my username. How do you think the circumstances and result of the attorneys having to voice objections privately before the judge affected the trial from the jury's view? They're not supposed to. They're not supposed to. When they they, they go to a sidebar sidebar, the jurors are not supposed to use that in any way in their deliberations. 
can't say they're human beings, what they take away from it. They shouldn't be hearing what is privately being said between the attorneys and the judge. That is why the attorneys go to the bench to have that conversation outside the presence of the jury. But your answer is it should have no effect. All right. I have to thank everybody for joining us today and for the super chats and the questions. We can't thank you enough. We really, really appreciate it discussing the Hannah Gutierrez Reed case. I know we've all waiting to see what is going to happen with these deliberations. Um, and look, we want to go live on YouTube more during these court lunch breaks uh, and talk about current trending trials regularly. Who knows, maybe even daily. If you like this segment, let us know in the comments for next time because I had a great time. I thought this was fun. There's nothing more fun for me than getting to hear from all of you, interact with all of you, learn about your opinions, your big cases. So let us know if you want us to do this again. Let us know if there's a case that you really want us to cover. Uh, we very much appreciate it. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.
Towards 10. I'll read it into the record when Haven's ready. Then you can come up and look at it. Okay, it's... Okay, it, um, it regards instruction 20, and it has a quote, quote mark to the language in uh, instruction 20, and I think it can be found in the second paragraph. Do you have copies of the instruction? You can share an extra cop- copy I have if you want. Yes, Your Honor, we uh, do have it. I have one right here. That changed. Are you going to share? Oh, Mr. Bulls has it. Okay, so it says, uh, it, instruction 20, quote, or constitutes an intervening cause that breaks the foreseeable chain of events, end of quotation marks. Clarification on if, quote, intervening cause, unquote, could mean things that could have been changed to prevent it. Here you can read this. Thank you, Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we're in recess. Thank you.
All right, you may be seated. All right. Just, just a minute. All right, ladies, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, through the four person, have you reached a verdict? Yes. All right. Let me see the verdict. Form. So let me repeat. I said, ladies and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, through the four person, have you reached a verdict? Yes. All right. And do you wish to read the verdicts? Sure. Okay. I would start with uh, count one. Oh. Okay. You have both of them. Will the defendant please stand? Guilty of involuntary manslaughter as charged in count one. We find the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, not guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in count two. All right, thank you. You may be seated. Let me get those forms, retrieve those forms from you. I'm going to do what's called polling the jury. What I need to put on the record is that this is your individual verdict, okay? So I'm going to start with the gentleman in the back. Is this your uh, verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is this your verdict? Sir, is this your verdict? Yes. Sir, is this your verdict? Yes. Sir, is this your verdict? Yes, your Sir, is this your verdict? Yes. Sir, is this your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is this your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is this your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is this your verdict? Ma'am, is this your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is this your verdict? Okay, thank you. All right, so you've completed your service. Um, thank you so much for um, being here. It was a, it was a long uh, trial. Uh, people may want to talk to you. Um, you know, this has been this pretty much a lot of publicity and you don't have to okay so you can just simply say do not, do not wish to talk and move on and if anybody bothers you we really try to protect your privacy if anybody bothers you simply call um, uh, my division and um, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, figure out what to do but you also may talk okay so it's entirely up to you okay um, all right so uh, I, I, you can escort them out all right. Thank you. All, right. All rise. George, just a minute. Just. All right, you may be seated. All right, is there anything that the uh, state's requesting based upon the uh, verdict? Uh, we would request that Ms. Gutierrez be taken into custody. Mr. Bowles? Your Honor, we would request uh, under, uh, pull up the rule, Your Honor. You got our rule 5402, uh, release pending sentencing uh, in this court's discretion under the same conditions or other conditions as this court would um, deem necessary. Ms. Gutierrez has been on uh, conditions 
She has not violated those conditions. She has voluntarily appeared at all court proceedings. Um, Your Honor, I would request this court to continue conditions for whatever conditions this court would, would have on release. All right, thank you. I'm going to remand you, and the reason why I'm going to remand you is you are now convicted. And so, um, and this is a death. It's an, uh, uh, a criminal negligence, but it's still a death. And so, uh, deputies, you're going to take her into custody, and we will set a sentencing date. What is the best, uh, what, do, what do we want to look like on that? And we need an order of remand, do we? Hey. Okay. Uh, counsel? Uh, in terms of the sentencing date? Yes. At, 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 at the court's convenience, we'll be available. Um, there are two weeks in May that I'm unavailable. Those are the last two weeks of May. All right. Mr. Bowles? Your Honor, as soon as uh, this court has time, we will be available. All right. So uh, do you have any conflict like that? She said May. Do you have any conflict? I don't know uh, for sure, Your Honor, that I can. I do have other trials, but I think mid May. Well, I can do it sooner. Okay. I just wonder if you had any conflicts along the way. I doesn't look like mid May, Your Honor. I, I do. I don't think I have any conflicts. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, not understanding. Do you have? Okay, we're in March. Do you have? Do you have? Or do you have time before May? We have time in April. Okay. Sure. All right. Okay. All right. Anything else before the court? Nothing from the state, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. We're in recess. Deputy. involuntary manslaughter and also not guilty uh, for the tampering uh, with evidence charge? I think it was spot on. Um, and, uh, you know, I think she was, she, I would have found her guilty. Um, all of the evidence was there. Um, I thought the tampering charge, again, I've said this time and time again, I, I hate to use the word bogus, but I don't know whatever common term to use. Um, there was no way that they could prove that uh, there was cocaine in that packet. I would have been objecting all over the place to, you know, all of the, the, you know, the evidence, the question and testimony that was put forth with respect to that. But again, uh, the only thing that um, I believe uh, Han Gutierrez Reed had to do was check those bullets, take the time and check those bullets. It wouldn't have taken her uh, 55 seconds. It wouldn't have taken her two minutes, but a life could have been saved that day. And I think that's what it comes down to those couple of minutes right before she passed off the gun. Everything else that happened is just, you know, it's just extra ancillary. Um, it's the fact that she should have taken the time to check. She wasn't under any pressure at that moment. She did not take the time. You know, it's it's sad. It's unfortunate. It's gutting. But, you know, this, this is what it is. I also think she was in over her head. I don't think she should have had this position. Um, and that goes to show, um, well, it, that's evidenced by how irresponsible, how sloppy she was on set, how disorganized she was on set. Ron Zimbrano, I, I want to get your uh, I want to get your opinion, uh, your reaction to this verdict of guilt. Uh, what do mm -hmm. you think? Ron, I think we're having uh, an. On the last point that my colleague said, on the last point that my colleague said about, um, and I agree with her that I don't believe um, Gutierrez Reed should, should have had this job. I think it was a job that she got because of who her dad was. Um, and that is not a good thing for Alec Baldwin because that is going to be part of the thing. Should have this young lady, I mean, she's a very young lady, should have had this responsibility um, to to have people's lives in her hands, especially, you know, how she was conducting herself. Um, and, 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 and that's, you know, I, I hate to bring it back to, to Alec Baldwin, but this is a, kind of a win for him. But, you know, it depends what the prosecution is going to do with regards to how they're going to handle this. Um, but I also agree with my colleague in the sense that, 
you know, there's a lot of evidence that she, that uh, Gutierrez Reed was dealing with, uh, not dealing with, but, but consuming drugs and alcohol when she should have been a serious person. It reminds me of that scene in um, Succession where the father was telling the kids, like, you're not serious people. Um, and I don't think she acted like a serious person that was required of her for the magnitude of what she was doing. Right. And that question of whether she was qualified for the job will ultimately be uh, something that those in production will have to answer. And those in production, of course, in this case, would be Alec Baldwin, who, of course, faces his own involuntary manslaughter charge and potentially his own trial coming up. And uh, I think that's going to be an issue that's going to be brought by the prosecutor, the same prosecutor uh, who was involved in this case, uh, the prosecutor Morrissey there. But we're going to uh, now take you back uh, a few minutes ago to when this verdict of guilt was read in case you missed it. So let's take a look at a clip of this verdict being read by the jury. Let's take a look. We find defendant Anna Gutierrez guilty of involuntary manslaughter as charged in count one. We find the defendant Anna Gutierrez not guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in count two. There you go. Swift justice, uh, a, a, a verdict of guilt against Hannah Gutierrez Reed, read by the foreperson of the jury. Now, Afi, you see uh, that dramatic moment of when uh, Hannah Gutierrez Reed is taken into custody um, and the defense team there uh, by her side. Do you think that there's going to be an appeal coming from the defense? Absolutely. Um, I think that's something that you automatically prepare for. Um, and, and I think that uh, the defense was also right for asking um, to be for her to be allowed to be out um, pending sentencing. Um, I would ask pending appeal. Uh, I think that's just kind of part of the course. It's pretty normal. No, absolutely. And, and Ron, uh, I want to put, you know, put yourself in the shoes um, of the defense there. Uh, what are your next moves? You're, you're filing a notice of appeal. You're looking at the record. You're trying to find uh, the points that are going to be strongest on appeal. Um, but in terms of the incarceration, just like uh, Afi just mentioned, are you filing a motion to try to get her released uh, while there is a uh, appeal pending? What's your next move? You execute every move possible to try to uh, get her out of prison, uh, try to get uh, the verdict reversed. You do everything possible to try to keep helping your client. I mean, that's that's our job as, as attorneys and advocates. Um, but as you, but those those are transactional things. I, the bigger picture is you have to get you know once you step away from from this very long, arduous journey, you have to look at the evidence that was presented to, at trial, not what you'd like to put, put at trial. How to look, but really look at the record, go back and read everything. And, and see how it is you could best do an appeal. And that takes a lot of work. Absolutely. And Afi, um, do you think that Alec Baldwin's defense team um, are looking at this verdict right now, considering their options uh, and, you know, the strategy they're going to employ for Alec Baldwin, they're going to be looking at this uh, as they formulate their playbook? Yeah, and it's good if, um, if this is the same prosecutor that's going to be prosecuting Alec Baldwin. You know, um, I'm always, you know, I always pull transcripts. They've got video because, you know, show me my opponent, right? Let me know what your tactics are. I want to observe or, you know, read uh, your strengths and weaknesses. But I do think that this this very, very quick verdict bodes well for Alec Baldwin and his team. I think that uh, the, the jurors put the blame squarely at the feet of um, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. So I, I think that, you know, I don't think that they're shivering in their boots. I think that this is that this is good for them. Also, I think there was some video that I saw during the trial where I saw Alec Baldwin and he was very much so in his zone. He was very much um, being an actor when he did the crossbody pull. It's not like he was playing around or, in, or, or taking anything lightly. It seems to me that he was handed a gun with a live round. So I, I think it bodes well for Alec and his team. Yeah, and Ron, uh, the prosecutor uh, in her summation to the jury in this trial uh, was, was quick to point out that in an involuntary manslaughter charge like this, based on negligence, criminal negligence, that there can be more than one cause uh, of the death. So you're talking about causation here, uh, and one uh, or more individuals can be liable or here criminally culpable uh, for the criminal negligence uh, that would have led to Helena Hutchins' death. 
Uh, this is going to be likely something that she's going to be pointing out to a jury if Alec Baldwin takes his case to trial, uh, that even though Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was found guilty uh, in her trial, that you can still find Alec Baldwin guilty of involuntary manslaughter in his trial. Um, do you think that's going to be a strategy that the prosecution is going to be employing um, during the course of the prosecution of Alec Baldwin? 100%. I think they have to. I think they have to implement um, that theory that, listen, more than one, yes, Gutierrez Reed was found guilty, but um, Mr. Baldwin also has his own criminal conduct that he should be prosecuted for, uh, on top of the idea that he he and the production that he's in charge of should have known better than hiring her and whatever other theory they're going to come up with. They're not just going to stick with one because this is, I think this is, this particular verdict is something that really boosts uh, Mr. Baldwin because he could just say, Listen, I, was, I never handled a gun. When I got the gun, I was re I was relying on someone whose profession it was to make sure it was safe, and that's a really good argument. It's very it's not complicated, and and one thing you want as someone who's trying cases is to give points to the jury that aren't complicated and there are not a lot of questions in their mind. Absolutely, and I just want to remind uh, everyone out there about what this case was about. It was about Helena Hutchins, who tragically lost her life mm -hmm. uh, on that set doing something likely she loved, right? She was uh, involved in, in movies, and so tragically, her life ends uh, when she is behind the camera uh, as she is filming this movie. Um, and, her, and our thoughts are completely with her family at this time. Uh, perhaps this provides at least some portion of closure. Of course, the legal uh, uh, issues, the legal cases, including with Alec Baldwin, continue on uh, after this uh, case. But Russ Armour, Hannah Gutierrez, was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, uh, found not guilty of tampering with evidence. Uh, and that does it for me here uh, with the verdict, breaking it uh, live to you viewers out there. Uh, but we want you to stick with Law & Crime for our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, I want to thank Afi Patterson, and also Ron Zabrano for joining me as we broke this verdict to you. Uh, have a good night. Hey everybody, Law and Crimes, Jesse Weber here. Thank you so much for watching our coverage of the Russ trial of Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. You know, this case makes me think about how people get hurt in all kinds of situations that should not happen. And if you do get injured, it is so important to know your rights and whether you should be compensated. That's why I want to highlight the official sponsor of this week's live trial coverage, Morgan & Morgan. They are actually the largest injury law firm in the whole country. And if you're going to take on big insurance companies that often lowball insurance offers in these cases, you need a big firm that's willing to fight. I mean, in the past couple of months, Morgan & Morgan saw verdicts of $12 million in Florida, $6.8 million in New York, and $26 million in Philadelphia. Now, mind you, these are all considerably higher than the highest insurance offers for these accidents. But what also makes Morgan & Morgan so special is that they have completely modernized the process for their clients. They make it super easy because you submit your claim, you upload documents, you talk to your whole legal team, all on your smartphone. That's it. You can see if you have a case in just a few minutes. And in terms of price, you only pay them if you win. There's no upfront fee. Maybe it's not that surprising that 3 million people call them every year. So if you're ever injured in an accident, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. You can submit a claim in eight clicks or less without even having to leave your couch. To start your claim, visit forthepeople.com slash live.